Hello, crime enthusiasts. Are you ready for another chilling investigation? The case of Debbie Lynn Randall. Debbie Lynn Randall was born on August 21, 1962, in Marietta, Georgia, to a loving family with two older brothers. Her parents divorced when she was young. Her mother later married a man named Roy, who became Debbie's stepfather. The family lived in a small apartment building. Debbie was a cheerful and sociable child. On the evening of January 13, 1972, after dinner with her family, Debbie went to the laundromat to supervise the laundry. Debbie's home was just a short distance from the laundromat, so her mother wasn't overly concerned about her safety when she was sent to do the laundry. The original plan was for Debbie to go with her brother, but he was feeling unwell, so Debbie's mother sent her husband to pick up the laundry and Debbie went with her stepfather, holding a box of laundry detergent. At the laundromat, Roy put the clothes in two washing machines and left, leaving Debbie waiting for the cycle to finish. After the wash, Debbie had to walk home and ask someone to pick up her clean clothes because she couldn't carry them herself. However, when the laundry should have been finished and Debbie still hadn't returned, her mother began to feel uneasy. It was getting dark outside, so she and her husband decided to walk to the laundromat to look for Debbie, but she was nowhere to be found. The employee informed them that Debbie had left the laundromat some time ago and had not returned. The news worried her mother, who began searching the surrounding streets with Roy. As they walked, they discovered a suspicious scene, a short distance from the laundromat, in the parking lot next to a car, there was a spilled detergent. Since Debbie had brought a box of detergent with her, her mother suspected that it might be hers. Despite expanding their search to the entire parking lot and the surrounding area, they found no other sign of Debbie. Neighbors who knew the family joined in the search. Debbie's mother decided to call the police for help. The police investigated the parking lot and discovered their first clue, spilled laundry detergent just inches from a parked car, and on the car door, they found several clear fingerprints. The police found fresh fingerprints on the car that were located lower than the handle, which seemed unusual. They suspected that an unknown person might have grabbed the girl while touching the car at this spot. The officers collected the fingerprints and sent them to forensic experts for analysis. They also started searching for the car's owner to confirm whether the fingerprints belonged to them. With no other leads, the police began a thorough search of the area, looking for new clues or witnesses. The laundry worker reported that she did not see anything suspicious. Debbie had waited for the laundry to finish, then left the building with the detergent box. It is possible that she went home to ask someone to pick up her clothes. Police discovered the first key witness, 12-year-old Sandra, who said that as she and her friend walked to a laundromat to drop off dirty clothes. They saw a man grab a girl on the street, drag her to his car parked near the laundromat, and drive away quickly while she screamed for help. Sandra and her friend were lucky to avoid the man's car. Debbie screamed in a car, but he did not slow down. At the time, Sandra did not consider what she saw to be a kidnapping, she assumed the man was a family member who had come to pick Debbie up, possibly against her will. So Sandra did not report the incident to the authorities or tell any adults about it. After learning about Debbie's disappearance, Sandra provided essential details to investigators. She described the abductor's vehicle as a dark-colored, likely 1957 model pickup truck. She also described the man as young, white, with thick dark hair, wearing a white t-shirt, jeans, and black work boots. Another key witness, a girl who lived in the same building as Debbie, shared her observations. She saw a dark-colored pickup truck drive past the apartment building on the evening in question. The girl initially thought the driver of the car was her uncle, but when he stopped in front of her and looked at her, she realized it was someone else. She described the driver as a white man with medium-length dark hair and provided additional details about his appearance. She also reported that he parked his car near their building, 
next to the same car where a detergent spill would later be discovered. Another witness, a man who lived near the girl's home, reported that a dark-colored pickup truck, possibly a Dodge, almost hit him while he was driving to visit his wife in the hospital. The driver appeared to be in his 30s with dark hair, and the witness saw a girl in the car trying to escape while the driver held her with one arm. Based on these accounts, the police believed Debbie had been kidnapped. They circulated the suspect's vehicle to all patrol units and created a composite sketch of the driver based on descriptions from witnesses. Some officers searched for similar vehicles and checked their owners, while others conducted a wide-ranging search for the girl. As the days passed, more volunteers and police from surrounding towns joined the search. Police questioned Debbie's family, and after investigation, they were all cleared as potential suspects. Debbie's biological father, who lived in the same city, was notified of her disappearance at work and immediately joined the search effort. Police also ran background checks on convicted criminals who lived near Debbie's home, but none of them appeared to be viable suspects. The search for Debbie continued for over two weeks without any significant leads. It wasn't until January 29th, when a group of students joined the search teams, that a breakthrough occurred. The students were sent to search a wooded area several miles from Debbie's house. After nearly five hours of searching, one of the students noticed a set of tracks on the ground that led from the trail into the forest, suggesting that something had been dragged into the woods. As they followed the trail about 150 feet into the woods, they discovered a human body and immediately contacted the police. Upon further inspection, they quickly identified the body as Debbie Randall. She was wearing the same outfit her mother had described on the day she went missing, however, her shoes were missing. The medical examination of the Debbie's body revealed that she had been strangled to death and had also been sexually assaulted. A single dark hair was found on her body, which was likely to belong to the killer. Although DNA analysis was not available at the time, experts were able to examine the hair under a microscope and estimate that it came from a man between the ages of 18 and 30. The investigation then focused on the victim's clothing, which was covered in soil. Police enlisted the help of a geologist to analyze the soil, along with a forensic team. They discovered that some of the soil contained a type of soil mined less than 10 miles from their town called North Georgia clay. However, other stains on the clothing were found to be from a different type of clay. Mined by a company just two miles from where the body was found. Police theorized that the perpetrator did not kill Debbie immediately, but rather drove her to remote areas, sexually assaulting her in one location and killing her in another before finally dumping her body in the woods. Police believe the killer may have been hired by one of the nearby mining companies. After contacting these companies, the police searched the employees of both companies but did not find the suspect or the vehicle described by the victims. Furthermore, they found fingerprints near the abduction site, but unfortunately, when these fingerprints were compared to the suspects, there was no match. Debbie's death sent shockwaves through the city, with thousands attending her funeral. Police repeatedly ran into roadblocks in their search for clues. Police officer Morris Nix investigated many suspects and eventually narrowed the list down to four people. For Morris Nix, Debbie's murder remained a top priority throughout his career. The case took a breakthrough with the creation of the FBI's DNA database. Experts successfully extracted a genetic profile from hair found on Debbie's body, which was then entered into the database. However, no matches were found. In 2015, 43 years after the murder, police reopened the case and decided to re-examine the victim's clothing using modern technology. The clothing had been stored in an evidence vault since the crime. When re-examined, some of the evidence had degraded over time, resulting in only a partial DNA profile. In 2018, Debbie's mother gave an interview, expressing her hope that her daughter's killer would be found. After the tragedy, she found it unbearable to stay in their apartment, so she moved to another city. 
Her only wish was for the case to be solved before she died. Sadly, she died of cancer at the age of 78, just weeks after the interview, and was buried next to Debbie. In 2019, the local police department received additional funding, which allowed them to conduct a more thorough analysis of Debbie's clothing. This time, experts successfully extracted a full DNA sample, but unfortunately, the perpetrator's DNA was still not found in the FBI database. Debbie's father was interviewed and shared that he thought about his daughter every day for decades sadly, he passed away in 2022, shortly after the interview. Police turned their attention to the first piece of evidence they had, DNA. They partnered with a Florida company that specializes in an advanced DNA analysis technique called genomics. Police provided the company with all the biological samples they had collected over the years and waited for the results. Experts created a DNA profile of the suspect and began searching for his relatives in public genetic databases. After analyzing thousands of potential relatives of the killer, investigators narrowed their search to a family in Marietta. In 2023, police asked the family to provide a DNA sample, which they agreed to. Analysis showed that the killer was indeed a close relative of the family. Experts re-examined the family tree and quickly identified a man named William Rose. However, William Rose committed suicide in 1974, just two years after Debbie's murder. Police obtained a warrant to exhume William Rose's remains and took a sample of William Rose's DNA for analysis. 51 years after Debbie's murder, police finally identified William Rose as the killer. At the time of the murder, William Rose, 24, lived in the same building as Debbie's family, and he visited them frequently. The case has finally been solved. Debbie's brother, Melvin, is the only living relative. Melvin attended a press conference and expressed gratitude to everyone involved in solving the case that lasted more than 50 years. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Adrienne Jones. Adrienne Jessica Jones was a bright light in Mansfield in 1995. As a 16-year-old junior at Mansfield High School, she captivated everyone with her beauty, exceptional qualities, and impressive achievements. Adrienne was an outstanding student, consistently excelling in advanced honors courses and demonstrating a strong work ethic. She spent at least two hours each night studying to ensure her success, which earned her high grades. Her kindness, intelligence, and infectious spirit made her a role model and a beloved figure among her classmates and teachers. In addition to her academic prowess, Adrienne was a talented athlete. She was a dedicated member of the girls' soccer team, showcasing remarkable skill and dedication on the field. After graduating from Mansfield High School, Adrienne's dream was to become a veterinarian and help animals. After a game injury forced her to temporarily leave her team, Adrienne didn't give up on sports. Instead, she joined the girls' cross-country team, which allowed her to stay active and improve her fitness. She threw herself into the new challenge, working hard to get in shape. Her dedication paid off, and she soon became a key member of the cross-country team. In addition to her academic and athletic pursuits, Adrienne also held down a part-time job, working 20 hours a week at a local fast food restaurant, Golden Fried Chicken. Despite her busy schedule, Adrienne enjoyed being the center of attention, particularly from teenage boys in Mansfield. Her friends would even describe her as a bit of a flirt. She took great care in her appearance, spending at least two hours each day on her makeup to ensure she looked perfect. Adrienne, like many teenagers, often tested the limits set by her parents. Despite her good nature, her parents were particularly protective of her due to the changing environment in Mansfield, where crime was on the rise. They implemented a strict 9 p.m. curfew on weekends to ensure her safety, requiring her to provide proof of her activities, such as ticket stubs, if she wanted to stay out later. To prevent her from sneaking out, her father also nailed her bedroom window shut. 
Although Adrienne occasionally disobeyed her parents and left the house at night to meet her friends, on Sunday, December 3, 1995, she was given special permission to stay up late to talk to her boyfriend, Tracy Smith, who was out of town with his parents. During their phone conversation, Adrienne's mother overheard her mention that another call was coming in. When asked about the caller's identity, Adrienne said it was David from her cross-country team who seemed upset about something. Adrienne's family started their day as usual the next morning, but her mother's concern grew when she heard Adrienne's alarm still going off in her bedroom. When she went to check on her, she discovered that Adrienne was missing and her bed had not been slept in. Despite trying to stay calm, Adrienne's mother quickly became worried. She initially thought Adrienne might have gone for an early morning run, but this idea was quickly dismissed when she saw Adrienne's running shoes still on the floor. In the past, Adrienne had occasionally sneaked out at night to meet friends, but she had always returned home by morning, making her mother even more worried about her disappearance. Worried about Adrienne, her parents contacted the police. Unbeknownst to them, a shocking discovery was made on a farm several miles away. At around 7 a.m. on Seton Road in Grand Prairie, Texas, a man was on his way to check his mailbox when he noticed that the gate to his property had been knocked down. Curious, he entered his farm and was met with an unsettling scene. Initially, the man thought he was looking at roadkill, but as he got closer, he realized it was a lifeless teenage girl lying on the ground. The man immediately called the police, who arrived to find a disturbing sight. The teenager had been shot execution style, with two bullet wounds on her left cheek and forehead. In addition to these gunshot wounds, her head had suffered severe injuries. Moreover, her arms and legs were covered in scrapes and bruises, indicating that she had run through the farm's barbed wire gate. A teenager's violent murder sparked a desperate investigation. The fact that she was found in her nightclothes suggested she had been preparing for bed when her life was brutally cut short. The execution-style killing led police to consider possible links to gang violence or drugs. After discovering the body on the farm, the Grand Prairie Police immediately alerted all nearby agencies, sending out a detailed description of the victim, including her age, height, weight, and other physical characteristics. They hoped that another agency might recognize the description and make a connection to a missing person. It wasn't long before the Mansfield police got in touch with Grand Prairie officers, having made a match. The Mansfield police identified the murdered teenager as Adrienne Jones. With the victim identified, the police had the heartbreaking task of informing Adrienne's parents about her tragic death. When they broke the news to her mother, she was overcome with grief. In the small town of Mansfield, news of Adrienne's murder spread quickly through her high school, leaving her classmates and friends devastated. Classes were interrupted as the news traveled through the halls and students tearfully consoled one another. The town was on high alert following the discovery of Adrienne's body in a field, with rumors and theories circulating about her death. One theory was that Adrienne was involved in drugs, while others suspected a serial killer might be living among them. Adrienne's parents cooperated with the police, providing information about the last time they saw their daughter. Her mother specifically mentioned a phone call Adrienne had with her boyfriend, Tracy, and another teenager, David, who joined the call while Adrienne was on the phone. After midnight on the night of Adrienne's murder, one of her younger brothers heard a car engine outside their house. When he looked out the window, he saw a pickup truck driving away. The police were interested in identifying a person named David, who had called Adrienne that night. To learn more, they spoke with Adrienne's cross-country coach, who mentioned a team member named David Graham. However, the coach was surprised to hear that David had called Adrienne as there was no indication that they had ever interacted before. David Graham was a 17-year-old high school student with big dreams. After watching his first air show, he decided he wanted to become an Air Force pilot. From then on, 
he dedicated himself to achieving his goal. David was well liked by his peers at Mansfield High School, where he was popular and charming. Many girls were attracted to him, but he was in a relationship with Diane Zamora, a high school senior who shared his desire to enter the military. Diane stood out from the crowd, actively pursuing her aspirations. After Adrian's murder, the police interviewed David Graham, who acknowledged knowing her from their cross-country team, but claimed their relationship never went beyond friendship. When asked if he had contacted Adrienne on the night of her death, David denied it, saying he was home studying with his girlfriend, Diane Zamora. The police investigated David as a possible suspect, seeking information from Adrienne's friends to see if she had ever mentioned him. However, one of her closest friends, who was privy to Adrienne's secrets, said Adrienne had never discussed David with her. The police also checked Adrian's phone book and found David's number was not listed, which further led them to believe he was not involved in her murder. As a result, they never administered a polygraph test to David and eventually cleared him as a suspect. The police investigated Adrian's boyfriend, Tracy Smith, as a suspect in her murder. However, they cleared him after verifying his alibi, which placed him out of town with his family on the night of the murder. Tracy also passed a polygraph test, further supporting his innocence. During his police interview, Tracy suggested they investigate someone named Brian, whom Adrian had mentioned was calling her on the night of her murder while they were on the phone. The police identified the Brian in question as Brian McMillian, a local teenager. Their investigation into Brian McMillian revealed that he used to work at a pharmacy near the restaurant where Adrian used to work. Brian had developed an obsession with Adrian and would often visit the restaurant to catch a glimpse of her. Eventually, Adrian grew tired of his constant presence and began hiding in the back whenever she saw him coming. The police questioned Brian McMillian about the murder of Adrian Jones. At first, he claimed to have no knowledge of her, but later admitted to knowing her. When asked if he had talked to her on the night of her murder, Brian said he didn't remember. He explained that he had been drinking that night due to feelings of depression and loneliness. The officers also asked Brian if he had visited Adrian's house on the night of her murder, and he acknowledged that he might have done so. The police asked Brian's father if his son could take a lie detector test, but his father refused. One week later, the police raided Brian's house with guns, a decision made due to concerns that he might be armed. The police took this precaution to ensure everyone's safety, including their own. After Brian was arrested for Adrian's murder, many people came forward to show their support for him. Brian's friends said he was a gentle and non-violent person. His father also confirmed that Brian was at home all night when Adrian was killed and didn't leave. Despite this, Brian was held in jail for three weeks, missing Christmas and New Year's, while the investigation and legal proceedings continued. During this time, the district attorney's office asked Brian to take a polygraph test, which he passed successfully. After this, the district attorney's office had little evidence to link Brian to Adrian's murder, so they released him from custody. Nine months into the investigation, the police in Mansfield, Texas, finally got a breakthrough and it came from Annapolis, Maryland, where Diane Zamora was attending the Naval Academy. Diane Zamora, a cadet at the Naval Academy, allegedly confessed to her fellow students that she and her boyfriend, David Graham, had murdered a girl named Adrienne Jones in Mansfield, Texas. The Mansfield police traveled to Annapolis, Maryland to interview Diane, but she denied making any such admission. The Naval Academy suspended Diane and sent her home pending an investigation. Since Diane was uncooperative, the police went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado to question David. Initially, David claimed he didn't know why Diane would fabricate a story about killing Adrienne Jones. However, during the interview, David began to crack and asked to write a statement. In a 4.5 page confession letter, David detailed how he and Diane planned and carried out the murder of Adrian Jones. 
including a cross-country event in November 1995, where he offered to drive Adrian home. During the ride, David and Adrian parked in an elementary school parking lot and had sex. Afterwards, David felt overwhelmed with guilt because he loved his girlfriend Diane deeply and knew that his infidelity would cause her immense pain. One evening, while David was helping Diane study for her SATs, they got into an argument. Unable to keep his secret any longer, David broke down in tears and confessed his infidelity to Diane. He told her that he had hooked up with Adrienne, which shattered Diane's heart and left her feeling deeply hurt and angry. Diane was inconsolable and lashed out at David, screaming and arguing with him. She was so angry that she wished he were dead, and she felt intense hatred towards Adrienne. Diane's emotions were too much to handle, and she struggled to come to terms with what had happened. David pleaded with Diane, promising to do whatever it took to save their relationship. David and Diane decided that the only way to repair their relationship was to kill Adrienne. In his confession letter, David admitted that on December 3rd, he called Adrienne Jones and asked her to secretly leave her house late at night to meet with him. He specifically asked Adrienne to keep their meeting private and not tell anyone else about it. David originally planned to lure Adrienne into a trap, kill her by breaking her neck, and then dispose of her body in a lake. On the agreed night at 2.30 a.m., David picked up Adrienne in his car while Diane hid in the hatchback. They drove to a secluded spot 10 miles out of town, turning off the highway onto Satan Road. David stopped the car and Adrienne subtly adjusted her seat, creating the impression they were about to be intimate. Unbeknownst to Adrienne, David had secretly signaled for Diane to emerge from the trunk. Diane came out of the rear of the vehicle and approached the front. Diane confronted Adrienne, who was seated in the passenger seat. Diane then hit Adrienne on the head with a weight from David's gym set. Despite being severely injured, Adrienne managed to escape by crawling out of the car window. David and Diane panicked, and David grabbed his 9mm Makarov weapon to chase after Adrienne. Adrienne was severely injured and collapsed in a nearby field due to her head wound. When David caught up to her, he shot her twice and then returned to his car. After Adrienne died, David and his accomplice Diane exchanged I love you as their first words to each other. The police later questioned Diane, who had a statement prepared to confess her involvement. David and Diane were arrested and charged with capital murder. Although they initially confessed, they later retracted their statements, with David claiming Diane acted alone and Diane alleging David committed the crime by himself. In 1998, Adrienne's mother requested that the death penalty be removed as a possible sentence for David and Diane. Diane's trial began in February 1998. Multiple witnesses testified that Diane showed no remorse for killing Adrienne. The jury found Diane guilty of capital murder, resulting in an automatic life imprisonment sentence with the possibility of parole in 40 years. David Graham was convicted of murdering Adrian Jones and received a life sentence with the possibility of parole in 40 years. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Cody Johnson. At the age of 23, Cody was looking for a long-term partner he confided in his friends about his desire to marry a woman who shared his values, specifically someone from a religious background. On Halloween 2011, he met Jordan, who would eventually become a pivotal figure in his life. Born in August 1991, Jordan grew up in Kalispell in a deeply religious family. She attended the Faith Baptist Church, where she worked with children and families, and her ultimate goal was to become a stay-at-home mother. When Cody and Jordan first met on Halloween, they quickly formed a connection. Although initially shy, Jordan opened up to Cody about her dreams of starting a family and her love for nature. Cody was smitten, but Jordan, who was only 20 at the time, was not ready for a serious relationship. They went on a few casual dates, but maintained a platonic relationship. However, 
Cody's feelings for Jordan only intensified, and he made a concerted effort to win her over. He joined her church, First Baptist, and began to socialize with her friends and community. Before long, their friendship blossomed into something more. Cody and Jordan officially started dating in November 2011, and Cody became completely enamored with her, wanting to spend all his time with her. Cody was convinced he wanted to marry Jordan just weeks into their relationship, despite her desire to remain chaste until marriage. Those close to they, they noticed Jordan didn't seem as invested in Cody as he was in her. While some attributed this to her shy nature, others were concerned about the imbalance in their relationship. They rarely showed affection in public, didn't hold hands, and didn't flirt. So, when Cody proposed in December 2012, many of Jordan's friends were surprised she accepted. They thought she wasn't ready for marriage after just a year of dating, but they were happy for her. Jordan eagerly shared her engagement ring on Instagram, captioning the post. He proposed, best early Christmas present ever. The wedding was set for June 29, 2013, and planning began immediately. Cody was heavily involved, along with Jordan's best friend and matron of honor, Kimberly Martinez. However, it was Jordan who seemed most enthusiastic about the wedding planning, even going so far as to perform a song with custom-written lyrics by Elizabeth Shee, which would later seem eerily prophetic. When someone, including Kimberly, brought up the idea of actually being married to Cody, Jordan's mood would quickly deteriorate. She repeatedly questioned Kimberly, her matron of honor, about whether she was making the right decision. On her wedding day, Jordan's true feelings about the marriage were evident. She was anxious and avoided eye contact with Cody, frequently looking down. Despite regaining her composure for the wedding photos and first dance, Jordan's unease persisted. The morning after the wedding, Jordan confided in a friend via text from their honeymoon hotel room. She revealed that she had not consummated the marriage and had rejected Cody's advances, not only on their wedding night, but for the next six nights as well. Jordan was anxious about Cody's expectations and didn't want to be intimate. She planned to use the excuse that her period had started, hoping it would work, as she feared being forced into something would cause her to panic. Jordan had an intense fear of sex due to her faith and reservations about Cody, causing her to feel anxious about intimacy with him. This anxiety reached a boiling point on July 7th, eight days after their wedding, when Cody canceled his golfing trip with friends at the last minute because Jordan had planned a surprise for him. After attending church and spending some time alone on the lake, they had dinner with friends at Dairy Queen. Cody then went home with Jordan, and this was the last time anyone saw him. When Cody failed to show up for work, his co-worker Cameron Fredrickson became concerned. As a reliable and punctual employee, Cody's absence was unusual. Cameron decided to visit Cody's new house, which he had purchased with Jordan before their wedding. After knocking with no response, Cameron let himself in and searched the house for any clues about their disappearance. However, he found nothing. Cameron's concern turned to fear when he discovered Cody's phone in the garage. It was unusual for Cody to be without his phone, and this sparked grave concerns. After making several calls, Cameron learned that no one had seen Cody since dinner at Dairy Queen at 8.30. He immediately went to the police station to file a missing persons report, and the authorities took the case seriously from the start. Officer Chaz Zimmerman, one of the first to question Cameron, was struck by his distress. Zimmerman found it odd that Cameron's boss, not his wife Kimberly, reported him missing. Later that day, Kimberly finally reached Jordan, who claimed that Cameron had left with friends in a black car with Washington plates. According to Jordan, Cameron had received a disturbing phone call at the restaurant, so she gave him space. However, that night, Kimberly retrieved her phone charger from their car and discovered a text from Cody the message stated that Cameron had planned to go for a ride with out-of-town friends who were visiting. Cody was unclear about the friends' identities,
but Cameron always took his visiting friends to Glacier Park. Jordan told the police that she didn't recognize the men who were involved in Cody's disappearance and that they hadn't fought that night. She suggested that Cody might have gone joyriding with his friends from out of town as a possible reason for his disappearance. When questioned about why she didn't report Cody missing, Jordan explained that she didn't want to upset him by filing a report if he was planning to return within a few hours. However, as the hours turned into days, Cody's friends and family gathered at the family home, expressing confusion over his sudden disappearance. It didn't seem like something Cody would do, leaving his wife without a word. Jordan maintained her story until Kim Kimberly confronted her about it. As the conversation continued, Jordan became increasingly uncomfortable. Eventually, she became so agitated that she threw her wedding ring across the room. While some thought this was just her unusual way of coping with the situation, Kimberly was convinced that Jordan was hiding something. The next day, she returned home and called her friend. Meanwhile, Jordan was summoned to the police station where she was confronted by officers about the inconsistencies in her story. One of the officers said, Jordan, I've gathered information that contradicts what you're telling me. I've spoken to several people and it's crucial that I know you're being honest. Jordan responded, I understand and I think there's more to the story. Around the same time, Sher Johnson met with the police, armed with Cody's phone records from the day he vanished. She was worried about her son and hoped that the mysterious man Cody had called could provide some clues about his disappearance. However, it turned out that the mysterious caller was simply a friend returning a tool to Cody. The police quickly ruled him out as a suspect because he had a solid alibi his wife was in labor at the time of Cody's disappearance. With all other leads exhausted, the police refocused their attention on Jordan. It was clear that she was hiding something, but her story didn't quite add up. On July 10th, a crucial breakthrough emerged in the case. An unexpected email arrived from Carmen Tony 607, claiming that Cody was dead and there was no need to continue searching. The message read, Hello, Jordan. My name is Tony. There is no bother looking for Cody anymore. He is gone. Jordan showed the email to Hannah, remaining expressionless as he relayed the news. According to the email, Cody had supposedly died after falling off a cliff in Glacier National Park while with unknown companions. Hannah was devastated upon reading the message and urged Jordan to report it to the police immediately. Hannah recalled her reaction. I was freaking out asking what was going on. I read the email and it said Cody was gone. Jordan didn't show any emotion, didn't even cry. She just handed me the email and I started shaking. I told her to go to the police and she did, but I was rushing her, saying, go, move, what are you doing? Detective Corey Clark was frustrated that the investigation was ongoing and an anonymous email hadn't provided the closure they needed. In fact, the email seemed suspiciously convenient at providing the exact information they'd been searching for and advising them to call off the search. What bothered Clark more than the email's content was Jordan's reaction, or lack thereof. She seemed completely unfazed by the news, which implied her husband's death. Jordan's behavior became even more peculiar when she organized a trip to Glacier National Park with her friends and family to search for Cody. According to Hannah, Jordan was strangely chipper. During the entire drive to the park, waving her hand out the window as they went. Despite finding nothing on the first day, they resumed their search on the second day. And it was then that Jordan suddenly claimed to have found Cody's body. Her announcement was met with skepticism. I think he's down there, she said, leaving Clark wondering why on earth Cody would be in that location. It's baffling that someone would do such a thing. This wall serves a purpose, after all. The autopsy revealed that the victim's head and arms suffered the most damage from the fall. Cody's loved ones were heartbroken over his death, but Jordan felt a sense of relief, according to Hannah. Now that a body had been found, the authorities would finally close the case. However, there was still a major issue. 
the police had no idea who man Tony 607 was. When Jordan was first questioned about the mysterious message, she directed the police to Tony Stalkup, a fellow car enthusiast and acquaintance of Cody's. Although Tony hadn't seen Cody in several months, he was so worried about him that he gave the police full access to his accounts. The police were unable to find the email address they were looking for, and Jordan and Cody's phone records did not provide much information. As a result, they had to contact Google to obtain the IP address associated with Carmen Tony 607. While waiting for this information, the police re-interviewed Cody's family and friends. During these interviews, Kimberly finally shared with the police Jordan's fragile mental state leading up to her marriage to Cody. She had expressed doubts and fears about marrying him, asking Kimberly multiple times if she should go through with the wedding. Jordan confided in Kimberly about her horror and fear of having sex with Cody, even regretting that Ed had married him and wishing she could undo everything. When Kimberly advised Jordan to be honest with Cody about her feelings, Jordan responded, I should be happy, but I'm not. If I tell him, it's going to break his heart. Two days before Cody's disappearance, Jordan typed a disturbing message. He held me down the other night, and he was in my face. On July 7th, the police discovered another revealing exchange, in which Jordan intended to talk to Cody, but was terrified of his reaction. Jordan went to her friend Kim's house later that day and recounted her conversation with Cody, which didn't go well. Cody became enraged and she left to give him space, eventually spending the night at her step-parents' house. When the police learned about this, they became more suspicious of Jordan. Around the same time, they received information from Google that linked the email address CarmenTony67 to her stepfather's computer Although a brief interview with each member of the Graham family suggested Jordan was behind the email, it wasn't conclusive evidence. However, cell phone records and security cameras painted a clearer picture. The records showed that Cody and Jordan's phones were in the vicinity of Glacier National Park on the night of Cody's disappearance. Security cameras even captured them entering the park at 9.17 p.m. Despite Jordan's initial denial of being with Cody that night, the evidence suggested otherwise. On July 18, 2013, the police brought Jordan in for questioning and presented her with the evidence. She broke down in tears and finally revealed her version of events from July 8. According to Jordan, she confessed her marital doubts to Cody, leading to a massive argument. Jordan and her friend decided to take a trip to Glacier National Park and went to the Loop Trail. Jordan explained what happened next in her own words. If her friend hadn't intervened, Cody would have fallen face first down the hill. The detectives asked her, why did she turn around and push him? Jordan believed it was because her emotions were overwhelming at the time. She felt immense pressure, anger, and every other emotion all at once. The detectives were interested in her comment about a blindfold, as they suspected a connection to a stray scarf found near the crime scene. However, Jordan didn't provide any further information, and it was eventually proven to be unrelated. Jordan claimed that Cody's death was an accident and that she didn't plan the assault in any way. Jordan explained that she hadn't planned to kill her husband, Cody. The situation escalated, and in the heat of the moment, she pushed him off the bridge. When asked about the incident, Jordan admitted that Cody had turned his back to her, facing the cliff, and she pushed him with both hands. She also confessed to creating a fake identity, Carmen Tony, and sending messages from her stepfather's house. Despite her confession, the police didn't charge Jordan that day, and she walked out of the station a free woman. However, they later arrested her at Cody's funeral on July 22nd, after she was seen texting on her phone, displaying a lack of respect that eroded any remaining sympathy for her. Rumors circulated that Jordan had killed Cody to escape their marriage without the embarrassment of divorce. Her behavior at the funeral, including texting, seemed to confirm these suspicions, implying that she was more concerned about herself than mourning Cody's death. 
Jordan's motives were called into question, as people wondered if she ever truly loved Cody. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and making false statements. After reviewing the evidence, the jury added premeditated first-degree murder to the list of charges. Her trial began on December 9, 2013. From the start, the prosecution aggressively challenged Jordan's story, raising doubts and inconsistencies. They questioned why she lied to Cody's friends and family, and whether she was truly remorseful or innocent. The prosecution's questioning was relentless, and Jordan's situation looked increasingly dire. The testimonies from Cody's loved ones further damaged Jordan's case, portraying her as a heartless wife who murdered her husband to avoid intimacy. Her defense team attempted to argue self-defense, but it seemed unlikely to succeed. Faced with the possibility of a worse outcome, Jordan opted for a plea deal, accepting a 30-year prison sentence without parole in exchange for the prosecution dropping the first-degree murder charge. Before Jordan was sentenced, she tried to withdraw her guilty plea when she learned the prosecution intended to pursue a charge of premeditated first-degree murder, which carried a maximum 50-year sentence. The decision was up to District Judge Donald Malloy, who had to decide whether to accept her original plea or start a new trial. On December 13, 2013, Judge Malloy sentenced Jordan Lynn Graham to 30 years and five months in prison. Despite Jordan's attempt to reverse her plea, her case was not reopened or re-examined. The federal prosecution aimed to set a precedent with her case, sending a message that anyone who commits murder under federal jurisdiction will face swift and severe punishment. As a result, Jordan will not be released from prison until she is over 52 years old. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Jessica Paget. Jessica was born on December 15, 1980, in Pennsylvania, where she spent her entire life. As a child, she was energetic and cheerful. However, her parents, Thomas and Danelle, divorced when she was young. Her mother later remarried, and Jessica formed a close bond with her stepfather, whom she considered her second father. After graduating from high school in 1998, Jessica attended college to study preschool education. It was during this time that she met her future husband, Michael Paget. They began dating, moved in together, and had two children over the course of their eight-year relationship. Although they didn't get married until August 2014, Michael was a caring father and husband. However, like any family, they experienced ups and downs in their relationship. Jessica was happy with Michael, but just four months after their wedding, she vanished. Before her disappearance, Jessica worked at a kindergarten in Northampton for two years. She loved her job, as she was passionate about working with children and had a natural ability to connect with them. The children adored her, and she enjoyed spending time with them. On November 21, 2014, Jessica dropped off her older children at school and then headed to work with her younger son, who attended the same kindergarten. It was a typical day, with no indication of the trouble that was to come. Jessica asked her administrator if she could take a short break from work to send a fax to her mother's house in a rural area near Northampton. The administrator agreed, and Jessica left her son at kindergarten before driving to her mother's house. She was expected to return to work within 30 minutes, but an hour passed and she didn't come back. Her colleagues tried calling her, but she didn't answer. When Jessica failed to return, the kindergarten administrator contacted her husband, Michael, to ask if he knew where she was. Michael said he was at work and hadn't heard from her. He tried calling her, but all his calls went straight to voicemail, which was unusual for Jessica as she always answered calls from her family. Michael then called his mother-in-law, Danelle, who was in Florida, to see if Jessica had contacted her. However, Danelle hadn't heard from her daughter all day and was immediately worried. She suggested that Michael call her husband, Greg, who was Jessica's stepfather, 
to see if he had any information. However, Greg reported that he hadn't seen or spoken to Jessica that day. As the minutes ticked by, Jessica's relatives grew increasingly worried. After numerous failed attempts to contact her, Danelle took a flight to Pennsylvania to search for her daughter. Meanwhile, for hours after Jessica disappeared from work, her husband Michael reported her missing to the police. He expressed his concern that Jessica would never leave their children voluntarily, leading him to fear the worst. The police promptly launched an investigation, distributing Jessica's description to all nearby stations. She was described as 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 130 pounds, with a footprint tattoo on her shoulder, brown hair, and hazel eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing gray sweatpants and a black hoodie with the words Duck Duck Goose on the front and Staff on the back. A thorough search of local hospitals and morgues yielded no results. Detectives worked to determine Jessica's whereabouts, interviewing her co-workers in the process. However, everyone they spoke to reported that Jessica had no enemies and was well-liked by her colleagues, children, and their parents. According to her co-workers, Jessica seemed fine when she left work at lunchtime, and they noticed nothing unusual about her behavior. Two hours after Michael reported his wife Jessica missing, the police were able to locate her phone's signal, which indicated that it was approximately one mile from the kindergarten where she worked. Although the data was not entirely accurate due to inherent location determination errors, it provided a general area for the police to focus their search. However, by the time they began searching, it was already nighttime. The police found Jessica's car, a white Subaru Outback, in a nearby parking lot. The vehicle was unlocked and empty, with her purse, documents, and bank card still inside. The keys were in the ignition, and her phone was on the passenger seat next to her purse. There were no signs of a crime in the car, leaving the police with several unanswered questions. Where was Jessica, and what had caused her to abandon her car and valuables so close to her workplace? To answer these questions, the police sought CCTV footage. A camera on the back wall of a store across the street had captured the area where Jessica's car was found. After reviewing the footage with the store manager, the police saw Jessica driving into the parking lot at around 1 p.m. She got out of the car and stood by the driver's door for a short time before leaving and not returning. The investigators were baffled by Jessica's disappearance, as she had left behind her documents, phone, and keys. It was unclear whether she had intentionally gone into hiding. Surveillance footage showed Jessica walking between two buildings towards another parking lot, where she vanished from view due to the lack of cameras. To get a better look at the footage, the investigators made a copy of the video to review on a larger screen at the police station. The Northampton Police Department, being a small force, enlisted the help of the Pennsylvania State Police to coordinate a search effort. Flyers with Jessica's photo were distributed throughout Northampton and surrounding cities, as well as shared on social media and through local news outlets. State police detectives began reconstructing the events leading up to Jessica's disappearance. They started by re-interviewing the kindergarten staff, who revealed that Jessica had left work to send a fax from her mother's house. The detectives then visited the house, which was approximately four miles from the kindergarten, in search of answers. The detectives met with Danelle and her husband Greg at the scene and learned that Jessica had keys to their home and could visit at any time. On the day of her disappearance, both Danelle and Greg had been out, Danelle in Florida and Greg elsewhere, which left uncertainty about Jessica's activities at the house. They also checked Greg's fax machine for records of usage, but found that the device was faulty, which didn't provide any clear information. Jessica might have used another fax machine, but it still didn't explain why she had left her belongings in her car. The detectives decided to speak with Jessica's husband Michael, as husbands are often suspects in such cases. To confirm Michael's story that he was the first to leave the house on the day Jessica disappeared, detectives investigated his claim. 
It was a possibility they couldn't rule out, as statistically, a significant number of disappearances involve a partner. As they continued the investigation, the police arranged a search party and local media alerted the public about Jessica's disappearance. Anyone with information was asked to come forward. By this point, 48 hours had passed, but no new leads emerged on Jessica's journey to her mother's house. To aid in their investigation, detectives scoured the route to her mother's house for surveillance cameras. One key location, an Exxon gas station adjacent to the main road leading to the mother's residence, had multiple cameras installed. Given the fact that this gas station was strategically situated on Jessica's stated route, the police logically inferred that if Jessica drove in the direction she said, she would be captured on camera. A review of the recording showed that her car was, indeed, captured driving by at approximately 12.56 p.m. From there, the journey to her mother's house took just a few minutes, suggesting Jessica would need to make the short trip back in order to utilize a functional fax machine, which wasn't operational at her mother's home. While fast-forwarding the tape to find a shot of the vehicle's potential return, detectives made a perplexing observation. The footage shows Jessica's white car speeding through a gas station just 14 minutes later. Notably, the car took a peculiar route, turning towards the gas station and continuing onto the other side without stopping, before heading towards the city center, where the car was later abandoned in a parking lot. Given her rapid pace, the likely reason for this unusual detour was a red traffic light at the intersection, which Jessica may have attempted to avoid by cutting through the gas station. From there, she drove onto a different road where the light was green and eventually left her car in the parking lot, where a police officer discovered it later. However, a surprising detail emerged upon closer inspection of the footage. Jessica, who was 5 feet 4 inches tall and 130 pounds, appeared to be much shorter and lighter than the person seen exiting her car. Measuring against the known height of the car, experts estimated that this person stood between 5 feet 11 inches and 6 feet 3 inches tall. Moreover, during their examination of the abandoned car, the police noticed that the driver's seat was pushed forward, which would make it uncomfortable for someone taller than 5 feet 11 inches to operate the vehicle comfortably. The police initially found it suspicious that the driver's seat was positioned for someone of Jessica's height. However, after reviewing the footage, they discovered that the person who got out of the car had adjusted the seat to its most forward position, attempting to make it seem like Jessica was driving. But this raised another question, who was the tall person seen in the footage? Michael, he, stood at around six feet tall. The police brought him in for questioning, and he denied any involvement in his wife's disappearance, claiming he was at work when the kindergarten staff called him. Detectives verified his alibi by interviewing his colleagues and tracking the geolocation of his phone on the day of Jessica's disappearance. The evidence confirmed that Michael was indeed at work at the time, which meant the person in the footage was not him. For days had passed since Jessica's disappearance, and her children were struggling to cope with the stress and uncertainty. Despite the ongoing search efforts, no leads had been found. Investigators re-examined the footage of someone exiting Jessica's car, but the person's identity remained a mystery. However, upon closer inspection, the officers noticed a detail they had previously missed. A minute after the unknown person disappeared from view, a white SUV, likely a Ford, left the scene. This new information led the police to Greg, Jessica's stepfather, who matched the suspect's height description and owned a similar vehicle. The police requested that Greg come to the station for questioning, leaving him shocked and dismayed to be considered a suspect in his stepdaughter's disappearance. Greg claimed that he had left his card at a service center for repairs and that a neighbor had given him a ride there to pick it up. He then stated that he had stopped at an Exxon gas station to grab a bite to eat. However, the police obtained CCTV footage from the gas station which showed Greg driving past the station just two minutes after leaving the service center. It turned out that Greg had lied about stopping at the gas station. 
Further investigation revealed that Greg's entire story was fabricated. His neighbor denied driving him to the service center, contradicting Greg's claim. This led detectives to suspect that Greg might have been involved in Jessica's disappearance. By piecing together the evidence, investigators concluded that Greg was likely at home when Jessica arrived. It's possible that something happened and Greg drove Jessica's car to a parking lot in the city center. The police searched Greg's house, where they found evidence that contradicted his alibi. The fax machine, which Greg claimed was not working, was found to be functional, and its usage history showed that Jessica had indeed sent a fax from the house on the day of her disappearance. Furthermore, a trash can in the basement contained napkins with bloodstains, and Greg's shoes, which were found in a dumpster on the street, had dried blood on them. Donnell reported to the police that Greg had requested an early trash pickup the day before, which seemed unusual at the time, especially since the trash can wasn't full. In hindsight, this could be how Greg disposed of evidence related to cleaning products and rags used in the house. During a second interrogation, the police confronted Greg, stating that they knew his previous statements were false and that they had found evidence in his home. They also informed him that they were aware Jessica had been at his house on the day she disappeared. Greg then began to talk. Greg claimed that when he returned home on the afternoon of November 21st, he found Jessica's car in the driveway and bloodstains on the carpet. He alleged that Jessica was already dead when he arrived and that he panicked, fearing no one would believe him. He supposedly drove Jessica's car to a city center parking lot and then returned home. Greg also stated that Jessica had outstanding debts, which he claimed led to her death. However, detectives later discovered that this was another lie, and they found evidence that Greg had purchased adult toys the day before Jessica disappeared. The investigators were fed up with Greg's inconsistent stories, so they directly asked him where he had hidden his stepdaughter Jessica's body, explaining that an autopsy would provide answers to many questions. Realizing he was caught, Greg changed his story again. This time, he claimed he was at home watching adult videos when Jessica arrived and asked to send a fax. According to Greg, he was standing behind her as she used the computer, and he became aroused and developed a desire for his stepdaughter. Without saying a word, he allegedly pulled out a gun and shot her in the back of the head. Then, he moved Jessica's body to the bedroom. Greg then drove Jessica's car to a parking lot in the city center, where he had previously left his Ford for repairs. To mislead investigators, he adjusted the seat to make it appear as though Jessica was driving. What Greg said next shocked the investigators. After returning home, he set up a video camera near the bed and recorded a video of himself with Jessica's body. The police later found this disturbing video on Greg's computer. Greg confessed to wrapping his stepdaughter Jessica's body in a blanket and hiding it in a ravine near his home. He claimed he was not a bad person, but had lost control. After the crime, Greg's life fell apart. He lost his business, home, dogs, and wife. However, he never mentioned the loss of Jessica. Jessica's mother, Danelle, was shocked to discover that her daughter was dead and that her husband was responsible. The authorities announced Jessica's death, stating that she was a victim of homicide. The district attorney, John Morganelli, expressed skepticism about Greg's version of events, but believed there was a sexual motive behind the crime. The prosecutor's office examined the evidence to determine if Greg had planned the attack. Jessica's family released a statement thanking law enforcement, the media, and the public for their efforts. They described Jessica as a beautiful and vibrant young woman who was loved by her family and friends, and stated that her loss made the world a darker place. Gregory Gregg, 53, was charged with the murder of Jessica Padet. Initially, investigators suspected that Gregg had tried to persuade Jessica into a romantic encounter, but when she refused, he killed her to avoid exposure. However, this theory was difficult to prove due to the lack of defensive wounds on Jessica's body. She died from a single wound to the back of her head, 
which corroborated Greg's testimony. Under Pennsylvania law, Greg could have faced the death penalty, but since Jessica was already dead when he committed the second part of the crime, the prosecution could not pursue the death penalty. An examination of Greg and Jessica's computers and phones revealed no evidence of a relationship beyond that of stepfather and stepdaughter. The trial began in 2015. District Attorney John Morganelli noted that Greg's lawyer, John McMahon Jr., failed to submit the results of a mental health evaluation for Greg. McMahon claimed that he had Greg evaluated for a possible insanity defense, but the evaluation found that Greg did not have a diminished mental capacity, so McMahon did not use it in the trial. During the trial, the jury was forced to watch a disturbing six-minute video that Greg had recorded, which showed him committing heinous crimes using adult toys he had purchased the day before. The jury was reluctant to view the video, but the judge ruled that they were obligated to watch it before reaching a verdict. Greg's lawyer argued that the crime was not premeditated and that his client should be charged with a third-degree crime rather than a first-degree crime. In response, Northampton County District Attorney John Morganelli presented the video as evidence to prove that the crime was, in fact, premeditated. Morganelli explained that this was necessary to convince the jurors of Greg's guilt, despite the disturbing nature of the footage. The jury delivered a unanimous verdict in just six minutes, finding Gregory Gregg guilty of taking Jessica's life and desecrating her body. As a result, the court sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. When asked by the judge if he had any final words, Gregg simply replied, No, sir. I'm just very sorry. Following the sentencing, the judge advised the jurors to seek counseling from a psychologist to cope with the traumatic case. Jessica's husband, Michael, spoke to reporters, expressing the difficulty of moving on without his beloved wife and raising their three children alone. He described Jessica as the most wonderful person he had ever met. In a separate matter, Danelle, Greg's wife, has initiated divorce proceedings. However, the process is proving to be complex and Greg is hindering her efforts. Welcome back, detectives. Let's dive into another horrible case. The case of Kelly Cochran. Christopher Reagan was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, where he spent his early years. At the age of 20, he decided to serve his country and joined the military. Christopher committed himself to protecting the peace and safety of his fellow citizens. Christopher was stationed at a military base near Marquette, where he met Terry O'Donnell, a young teacher from Iron River. They lived in the same area and would often see each other around town as they spent more time together. They remained close friends for many years, but Christopher eventually decided to leave the military and move to Traverse City. Despite the distance between them, they continued to communicate regularly, and in December 2012, Christopher asked Terry to take their relationship to the next level. Terry and Christopher have known each other for many years, they find they have a lot in common, they decide to live together, Terry and Christopher choose Iron River as the perfect place for them to settle down. Christopher finds a job at a factory that makes parts for military ships, where he becomes a supervisor. However, after two years of living together, problems began to arise in their relationship. Unfortunately, they didn't make an effort to work through their issues, and it became clear that their relationship was coming to an end. Eventually, they made the difficult decision to go their separate ways. Despite the breakup, they were able to part on good terms and remain friends. After breaking up with Terry, Christopher realized that he couldn't live in her house anymore, so he decided to rent his own house. He felt that the town he lived in was too small, and he wanted a more dynamic city. Christopher began applying for jobs in various locations, sending out his resume in search of a new job. In October 2014, Christopher found a job in Asheville, North Carolina. As Christopher settled into his new life in Asheville, he contacted Terry on October 14th, telling her that he would be taking the day off tomorrow and looking forward to meeting Terry for a walk. However, 
On October 15, Christopher did not contact Terry as planned. Terry became worried and tried calling him for several days, but he did not answer. She even contacted their mutual friends. Ten days after Christopher went missing, Terry filed a police report. The police accepted the report and told Terry that Christopher had probably moved to a new job in North Carolina and that he had started a new life and wanted to contact old friends. To avoid speculation, investigators conducted a thorough investigation. They identified Christopher's new workplace and contacted an employee to gather information. However, surprisingly, they found out that Christopher had not shown up to work in 10 days. The police then suspected that he might have been involved in an accident, given his frequent solo outdoor trips. The search for Christopher led investigators to the local woods, where he was known to frequent. Trained search dogs were brought in to aid in the effort. But no signs of Christopher were found. Terry, concerned that Christopher may have been injured or in an accident, suggested searching his former apartment. The investigators agreed and visited the apartment, where they were met with a scene of disarray. Clothes and belongings were scattered across the floor, and closets were left open. Initially, they thought that Christopher might have simply been messy, but Terry disputed this, stating that Christopher was typically meet and organized. The detective started to suspect a connection between the recent events and the crime. After investigating Christopher's home, they decided to expand their search. A thorough search of the neighborhood led them to find Christopher's car eight miles outside Iron River, near the city limits. The police found it unusual that the car was left there, suggesting it might have been abandoned unintentionally. After forcing open a door, they searched the interior and found nothing suspicious, only ordinary clothing. However, one of the officers noticed a small yellow piece of paper on the front passenger seat with a detailed route written on it. They decided to follow the route to see where it led. Although the paper did not specify an exact address, the directions were clear. According to Terry, Christopher, although familiar with the city of Iron River, did not know the local street names, so he wrote down the directions using landmarks such as bus stops and gas stations. Terry deduced from the detailed notes that this was Christopher's first time visiting the location. The detectives followed the route outlined on the paper, which led them to a nearby town and a specific house mentioned in Christopher's notes. When they arrived, they knocked on the door to gather information in Christopher's connection to the location. A man named Jason Cochran answered the door, and his wife Kelly was there. The police explained that they were investigating Christopher's disappearance and had found a lead pointing to this address. Terry, who worked with Christopher at the same factory, revealed that they were co-workers. She had tried to contact Christopher via text message in mid-October but had not received a response. Investigators found a note in Christopher's car that showed the route to Jason's house. Although confused, Jason and Kelly agreed to cooperate with the investigation. After a short interrogation without any further clues, the detectives left Jason Cochran's house. Detectives then interviewed Christopher's co-workers at the factory. A supervisor shared that Christopher had been having an affair with Kelly Cochran, which was an open secret among employees. This revelation sparked interest, leading investigators to re-question the Jason and Kelly during re-interrogation, Kelly confessed to her relationship with Christopher. However, she claimed that she could not reveal this information earlier because her husband Jason was present. According to Kelly, Jason agreed to her affair. However, Christopher's colleagues disputed Kelly's story. They claimed that Jason did not approve of Kelly's affair. When Jason was later brought in for questioning, he completely denied approving of Kelly's affair. His strong objection to Kelly's infidelity aroused suspicion and made him a suspect. The investigation into Christopher's disappearance was ongoing, but the lack of concrete evidence made it impossible to determine whether Kelly was involved. As a result, Kelly and Jason were released from the police station. The case remained unsolved for five months. 
In March 2015, a new investigator, Detective Jeremy Ogden from the Hobart Police Department, took over the case. Jeremy Ogden began by thoroughly examining the Jason Cochran family's background. Kelly and Jason had met in high school and started living together soon after graduation. They had distinct personalities. Kelly was outgoing, sociable, and talkative, while Jason was quiet and reserved. He rarely initiated conversations, only responding to questions asked of him. Despite their differences, they decided to get married. After the wedding, they started a business together, providing swimming pool maintenance services. The business was modest, but it provided a decent income for they. Jason handled most of the pool maintenance work, but the constant stress and physical strain took a toll on his health. He began to experience back problems and felt increasingly heavier every day. Eventually, he realized he could no longer continue running the business. Kelly then took over the responsibilities of running the business, hoping that Jason would soon recover and return to his duties. However, his condition continued to worsen and medical treatments were not providing the desired relief. Kelly searched for alternative ways to help her husband recover. During her search, Kelly discovered a plant that offered hope for Jason's recovery. However, the plant was banned in their home state, making it inaccessible to them. To access the treatment, Kelly and Jason decided to relocate to Michigan, specifically Iron River Township, in 2014. Jason consulted his doctor and received a prescription for pain medication. Around the same time, in early 2014, Jason's wife, Kelly Cochran, started working at a factory that manufactured parts for U.S. warships. Kelly and Jason moved to the area. Kelly and Jason worked at the same factory where Christopher Reagan worked. Christopher and Kelly found common topics of conversation and over time became close friends. This friendship was especially important to Christopher. After gathering evidence, prosecutors presented their case to a Michigan judge to obtain a search warrant for Kelly and Jason's home. The judge granted the warrant, and on March 6, a team of investigators searched Kelly and Jason's home, carefully searching for any evidence related to Christopher's disappearance. The only significant discovery was a book written by Jason. He used a pseudonym in the world of video games. The title of the work was ordinary, but its content was horrifying. In this dark and violent book, Jason described the murder of the person who had harmed him. After reading the book, the detectives noticed a character who bore an uncanny resemblance to Christopher. This raised suspicions about Jason, leading them to wonder if he had been inspired by the real-life crimes he had committed. Three weeks later, a second search of Jason's home was conducted. The police hoped to find crucial evidence that had been missed in the first search. However, when they arrived at the Jason's home, they found it empty, with no cars in sight. Repeated attempts to knock on the door went unanswered. It was later discovered that Kelly and Jason had fled the state shortly after the initial search, moving to Indiana. Their sudden departure left investigators concerned. Michigan police, needing a DNA sample, asked Indiana police for help. Indiana police went to Jason's new home, where they had just moved. The investigation into Christopher Reagan's disappearance ran out of clues. Time passed, and on February 22, 2016, Hobart, Indiana, police received a frantic call from Kelly Cochran, who tried to explain that her husband, Jason, was not breathing. When paramedics arrived, Kelly was in a panic. It was clear that Jason was beyond saving. He was sitting in a chair, his face burning like fire, as if he had overheated. The doctors officially confirmed Jason's death. His body was then sent for a thorough forensic examination. Meanwhile, Kelly was handed over to a police patrol and taken to relatives who lived nearby. To piece together what happened, investigators thoroughly searched the Jason's new home. During the search, a police officer found a syringe at the foot of Jason in his wife's bed. Initially, 
Investigators believe Jason's death was due to substance abuse. The medical examiner's report showed that Jason had multiple drugs in his system, but Jason's death was due to strangulation, confirmed by bruises on his neck and face. The focus of the investigation then shifted to Kelly Cochran, who appeared to be connected to both crimes. She was now considered the prime suspect in not only Christopher's disappearance, but also her husband's murder. On February 23, 2016, Kelly Cochran was summoned to the police station to answer questions about her husband's death. Under direct questioning and pressure from investigators, Kelly denied any involvement in her husband's death and Christopher's disappearance. She claimed that Jason's death was due to a drug overdose. Months later, Investigators still lacked concrete evidence to convict Kelly. During the investigation, Detective Jeremy Ogden met Walter Hammerman, a close friend of Jason's. Kelly informed Walter of Jason's death, who then contacted the police. Walter shared his insights with investigators, saying he did not believe Jason's death was caused by drugs. He claimed that Jason had used herbs to relieve his chronic back pain. In March of the previous year, Jason confided in Walter about his concerns. Jason and Kelly were asked to go to Indiana because the Iron River police suspected them of being involved in Christopher's disappearance. This had a significant impact on Jason, leading to depression. Walter observed the notable change in Jason's behavior, with Kelly increasingly taking control over his life. Jason appeared to be constantly anxious, and he began to avoid social gatherings as soon as Kelly returned from work. As the investigation progressed, this information became a vital link. After the medical examiner determined that Jason had died from strangulation, Detective Ogden devised a plan to pressure Kelly into revealing the truth about Jason's death. Walter Jason's friend was used as bait to lure Kelly into a trap. On March 12, 2016, Walter, under police surveillance and equipped with a listening device, called Kelly. He told her that Jason had given him a letter containing important information before his death, with the condition that it be sent to the police if anything happened to him. However, Kelly surprisingly asked Walter to drop the idea, which caught both Walter and the police off guard. Despite this development, the detective still lacked direct evidence to build a case. In the weeks following her initial questioning, Kelly was subjected to multiple interrogations by investigators trying to uncover the truth. Despite their efforts, she continued to deny any wrongdoing. However, on April 26, 2016, it became apparent that Kelly Cochran had evaded the scrutiny of investigators and was on the loose. Detectives joined forces with police officers from Iron River and Hobart to launch a federal manhunt for Kelly Cochran. Walter Hammerman, who had cooperated with the police, was shocked and frightened by the news. He feared that Kelly might never be caught and could potentially harm him again. As the search for Kelly intensified, her phone went off, leading investigators to believe she was deliberately concealing her location. Kelly evaded police and fled to Wingo, Kentucky, over six hours away from Hobart. A detective notified the local authorities to exercise extreme caution if they found Kelly. Police in Wingo identified Kelly at her cousin's house on April 28. Understanding that she posed a potential danger and was prone to attempting to escape, officers rapidly proceeded to the residence, avoiding advance warnings that afternoon and detaining Kelly on site. During the interview, Kelly revealed new details. That Kelly was deeply in love with Jason and wanted to leave the city life behind to start over with him. On October 13, 2015, Jason discovered Kelly's infidelity. Jason made a dark pact. The adulterer was obliged to kill his lover if the affair was exposed. Kelly claimed she had never taken this pact seriously, thinking it was just a joke. However, Jason was resolute and warned Kelly that if she didn't fulfill her end of the bargain, he would take matters into his own hands. Despite her reservations, Kelly reluctantly helped Jason commit a heinous crime. The next evening, October 14, 
2015, Christopher arrived at Kelly's house, eager to spend a romantic evening with Christopher while her husband was away. Kelly had planned a fun evening, complete with dinner and intimacy. Kelly and Christopher had dinner together and then went upstairs to the house, then Jason suddenly appeared. Jason rushed into the bedroom, holding a rifle, Christopher immediately realized that he was in danger. Without hesitation, Jason shot Christopher in the head, killing him. Jason and Kelly then dragged the body down to the basement, where they began to dismember it with a hacksaw. Jason and Kelly cut Christopher's limbs and head off his body and placed the remains in several garbage bags. They then dumped the bags in the woods near Crystal Falls. To avoid suspicion, they drove Christopher's car away from the house. Kelly and Jason thoroughly cleaned the house to remove any evidence of the crime. Kelly was consumed by a deep-seated anger towards her husband, whom she blamed for ruining her chance at happiness with he she truly loved, Christopher. She couldn't forgive her husband for depriving her of the opportunity to be with him, and the pain and loss she felt lingered every day. Kelly's resentment towards her husband eventually turned to hatred, and she knew she could no longer live peacefully with him. An opportunity for revenge presented itself on February 22, 2016, when her husband complained of back pain. Kelly convinced him to let her give her an injection, but she deliberately gave him a dose that killed him. However, the medication didn't work as planned, and her husband was still breathing. Kelly then suffocated him by covering his mouth and nose with her hands. To ensure he was dead, she also squeezed his neck, which explained the bruises found on his body. After confessing to the crime, Kelly cooperated with the police to help them locate Christopher's remains. On May 18, 2016, Detective Jeremy Ogden led a team to a remote area near Crystal Falls to search for Christopher's body. A canine unit picked up the scent and led the team to a small hill where they found a human skull with bullet holes, indicating a homicide. The team believed they had discovered Christopher's remains. Further examination of the scene yielded additional evidence, including a 22 caliber bullet, a broken firearm, dental records later confirmed the victim's identity. This breakthrough finally solved the case that had haunted investigators for two years. Kelly Cochran was formally charged with the murders of Christopher and Jason Cochran in April 2016. On February 13, 2017, Kelly was brought to court in Michigan to face charges. The prosecutor argued that Kelly was the mastermind behind the crime and that she had planned and executed. The prosecution presented strong evidence, including Kelly's own confession, to support their case. However, Kelly told a different story. She claimed that her husband, Jason, was the one who had planned and committed the crime. According to Kelly, Jason was jealous and had been abusing her. On the day of the crime, Jason allegedly hid in the basement and surprised Kelly and Christopher, then shot Christopher in a fit of rage. Kelly also claimed that Jason had forced her to help him dismember the body by threatening to harm her. Despite Kelly's new version of events, the jury found her guilty of premeditated murder after deliberating for three hours. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After being sentenced, Kelly Cochran was sent directly to Crown Point Correctional Facility in Ionia, Michigan, where she is currently serving her sentence. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Michelle Anglin. Michelle Lee Cohen Anglin was born on November 27, 1973, in Fountain Valley, California, but soon her family moved to Arizona, where she grew up with her mother Peggy and stepfather Larry McCall. She also had two older sisters, Cindy and Christina. At around 20 years old, Michelle started dating Hudson England, and they gradually fell in love. When Hudson proposed, Michelle accepted without hesitation. In late 1995, the couple got married in the presence of their families and friends, planning a honeymoon and their future together. However, tragedy struck just four months after the wedding, 
changing Michelle's life forever. Michelle's mother, Peggy Cohen McCall, a realtor herself, inspired Michelle to join the industry. According to the Arizona Association of Realtors, there are no mandatory safety measures in place for Arizona realtors. Nevertheless, many builders and agencies provide them with various resources and safety tips to help them stay safe on the job. When Michelle was at the office, her family members, including her husband, sisters, and mother, would typically get in touch with her using her work phone. Whenever she was out showing houses to clients, Michelle would always carry a pager with her so that her family could reach her if needed. However, on February 9, 1996, Michelle failed to respond to her loved one's calls and messages, which was unusual behavior for her. Normally, she would let someone know about her plans to show a house to a potential buyer. The job of a realtor comes with significant risks, often higher than those in other professions. Realtors can be attractive targets for predators because they often work alone and sometimes show properties in remote areas. Experienced realtors are well aware of the dangers associated with this job. Predators may lure them to an isolated location, such as an empty house with no nearby neighbors, under the guise of wanting to buy a property. In reality, they have a different motive. When a realtor finds themselves alone in an empty house with such an individual, the situation can quickly turn bad. To avoid potential risks, realtors are cautioned to maintain a safe distance from clients, stay near the front door, and leave immediately if they sense anything unusual. This is why Michelle's family became worried when they couldn't reach her during the day. Michelle's sister, Cindy, was dating a Phoenix police officer. Concerned about her sister's safety, Cindy asked her boyfriend to perform a welfare check at Michelle's workplace. When he arrived, he found Michelle's car parked outside, but upon inspecting it, he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary and assumed Michelle was working in the office. However, when he entered the office, he was surprised to find no one there. The lights were on and music was playing, but what he saw next raised concerns. Michelle's purse and pager were left on the table, unlocked, with no signs of struggle or explanation for her sudden departure. That evening, Michelle's family filed an official missing persons report with the police. Earlier that day, Michelle had scheduled a meeting with a potential buyer to show them three houses near her office, so she decided not to drive. The police officers who responded to the report inspected Michelle's office and then visited the three model homes she may have been showing to the buyer. They performed a preliminary search of each house and found three pink buttons in the master closet on the second floor of one of them. They also noticed that two candles in the master bathroom had been knocked over, one into each sink, but everything else seemed undisturbed. Cindy's boyfriend got in touch with Cindy to ask if she could describe what Michelle was wearing that day. He wanted to know if the pink buttons found belonged to Michelle's clothes. Unfortunately, Cindy couldn't recall what Michelle had on that day. The officers were convinced that the buttons belonged to a woman due to their color. The police conducted a more thorough search of all three houses, focusing especially on the one where the buttons were discovered. Tragically, they found Michelle Anglin's lifeless body under the master bed, which was twisted, severely bruised, and showed signs of a violent struggle. In the closet of the same bedroom, they found traces of seminal fluid, indicating a possible sexual assault. Further investigation revealed broken ceramic candlesticks, pieces of Michelle's clothing, paint, and plaster chips under the bed, as well as in the master bathroom. However, the autopsy revealed no evidence of forced intimacy before Michelle's death. The forensic expert concluded that the perpetrator had attempted to undress Michelle, but she resisted, leading to a violent struggle. Michelle was ultimately strangled, as evidenced by three bruises on the left side of her neck and one on the right side. According to court documents, a fierce fight took place between Michelle and her attacker in the master closet and bathroom. The master closet contained buttons and seminal fluid, indicating a significant struggle. 
Additionally, the master bathroom area had damaged candles and candlesticks, while both the bathroom and under the master bed had paint and ceramic chips. These findings demonstrated the extent of the violence. Michelle's clothing was torn and intertwined, suggesting that the perpetrator had forcibly ripped it from her body. She suffered numerous abrasions and bruises on various parts of her body, and her injured hands and wrists indicated that she had been struggling to defend herself. Michelle's mother, Peggy Cohen McCall, reflected on her daughter's tragic death, saying she thinks about her every day. However, instead of remembering the good times, she can only recall the bad times and the fear Michelle must have felt in her final moments. Peggy Cohen McCall was not present to comfort her daughter and alleviate her fears. Following her daughter's death, Peggy Cohen McCall claimed she lost her job due to speaking out about the dangers faced by women working alone at open houses and model homes. The police's first port of call in their investigation was Michelle's husband, Hudson England. This was a routine step as the police always consider the possibility that a family member might be involved in a crime. Michelle's family didn't think Hudson was capable of taking his wife's life, given that they had been married for just four months and seemed happy and in love. However, it's worth noting that a short marriage doesn't rule out the possibility of foul play, as seen in the tragic case of Krista Alexander, who was found dead just four months after her wedding. The investigators interviewed Hudson, and he appeared genuinely shaken by Michelle's death. He readily shared his whereabouts and activities on the day of her murder. According to Hudson, he had spent the day visiting car dealerships in search of a family car, as he and Michelle were planning to start a family. The police verified his alibi and found it to be true, which led them to clear him of suspicion. Hudson also told the investigators that he had no idea who might have wanted to harm Michelle and suspected that she might have been attacked by someone she was showing the house to. The police examined Michelle's mobile phone records, which revealed that on February 9th, she was on a call with a fellow sales agent between 3.45 and 4.15 p.m. During this conversation, Michelle mentioned that she had to end the call because a potential buyer had just arrived at her subdivision. The agent tried to return Michelle's call between 4.30 p.m. and 5.00 p.m., but received no answer. This information allowed the detectives to narrow down the time frame of Michelle's attack. However, they still needed to identify the identity of the potential buyer she was supposed to show the model homes to. Unfortunately, Michelle did not mention the man's name during her phone conversation with the fellow agent, nor did she record his name in her work notes. The police lacked immediate leads on the mysterious potential buyer due to lack of information. To generate leads, they sought out witnesses, interviewing residents in the area where Michelle was attacked. A local resident, who coincidentally arrived home from work between 4.45 p.m. on February 9th, reported seeing a white man descending the steps of one of the three houses for sale. This witness also noticed a black, older model Chevrolet pickup truck with California license plates in the house's parking lot. Additionally, prospective buyers who visited the subdivision between 4 and 4.30 p.m. that day recalled seeing a man walking from the direction of the second and third model homes. They also reported that candlesticks in the third model's master bath had been knocked over into the sinks. The police made a public appeal through the media, seeking any relevant information about the case. They shared details about Michelle England's attack, hoping for clues, and fortunately, this effort was successful. Kim Ramos, a young real estate sales associate, contacted the police on February 9th, the same day Michelle's lifeless body was found. Ramos reported that at around 2 p.m. that day, she had met with a potential buyer who drove an old black Chevrolet pickup truck. The truck caught her attention because it seemed out of place with the half-million-dollar house the client wanted to buy, suggesting a more modest lifestyle. The client asked Ramos to accompany him to a two-story house to answer some questions. Although she went with him, 
She was cautious due to his invasion of her personal space, walking too close and touching her hand several times. She also thought his questions about the tiled floor and the option of a fourth bedroom and den were unconvincing. Ramos asked the client to fill out a guest registration card, which he completed, listing his name as James Adams and providing his home address and phone number. Later, police officers arrived at the address and saw an old black Chevrolet pickup truck with California license plates. Although 32-year-old James Van Adams, the truck's owner, was not home, the police took pictures of the truck and showed them to Ramos. She confirmed that it was the same pickup truck driven by the suspicious client she had met earlier that day, just before Michelle England's death. When investigators looked into James Van Adams' past, they were surprised by what they found. He was married and had a child, but he and his wife were currently going through a separation. Adams had a criminal record, having been convicted in California for a crime he committed in 1990. Melissa Cunningham, a petite five port four sales agent weighing 102 pounds, was working alone at a new apartment complex when Adams approached her. He asked her to show him around the model homes that were still under construction. Specifically, he was interested in a two-story model with a master bedroom and bathroom upstairs. Melissa spent a few minutes with Adams in the upstairs master bedroom and bathroom. As they made their way back down the stairs, Melissa, who was leading the way, heard two thuds that sounded like footsteps. She felt a sudden push and fell to the floor below. Adams quickly apologized, claiming he had tripped on a nail, which they both looked for as an explanation for the incident. Adams grabbed Melissa from behind, wrapping one hand around her neck and choking her while twisting her head to the left with his other hand. He threatened to break her neck if she screamed. He then dragged her down the hallway into the kitchen, threw her to the floor, and started tearing off her clothes. Luckily, Melissa managed to escape. She memorized the license plate of Adam's truck and contacted the police. Adams was soon arrested and spent only two years in prison for the attack. When investigating Michelle England's death, it didn't take long for detective to discover Adams' previous failed attack. They obtained a search and arrest warrant, returned to Adam's home, and took him in for questioning. However, he refused to talk and appeared nervous, with injuries under his eye. The detectives suspected that these injuries could have been inflicted by Michelle, defending herself with the missing candlesticks, which were later found. They took samples of James's DNA, blood, and hair for further investigation. Kim Ramos who had met with Adams just a few hours before Michelle's body was found, stated that when she showed him around the house, he didn't have any injuries, bruises, or scratches on his face. However, Adams later claimed that he got hurt while working on his pickup truck. But during the investigation, it was discovered that Adams left work on February 9th at noon and didn't return, citing car troubles. His employer and colleague testified that when they saw him next, he had a facial injury and a black eye that hadn't been there on February 8th or 9th. Initially, the analysis of Adams's DNA, blood, and hair samples excluded him as a contributor, but when the crime lab retested the samples, they got contradictory results, this time including him as a contributor. The Department of Public Safety, DPS, verified the latter result with additional testing. Although the police took extensive fingerprints and footprints at the model home, none of them matched Adams. James Van Adams denied any involvement in the crime. His trial started on July 1, 1997. Prosecutors presented evidence that implicated Adams in Michelle's death, including testimony from Kim Ramos, who believed she was lucky because Adams had intended to target her before attacking Michelle. Ramos also stated that she didn't believe Adams was genuinely interested in buying a house, citing his clothing, vehicle, and questions about the flooring and fourth bedroom, which she thought were absurd. The state also presented evidence of Adams' interactions with other sales agents on several occasions. In California, several years prior, Adams had interacted with agents. Additionally, 
Months before the attack on Michelle England, he had been in Briarwood, Sientra, and even hours before the attack, he was in contact with other agents. Susan Wright, an employee of Holmes by Dave Brown, testified that she had multiple face-to-face -face meetings with Adams at the Briarwood subdivision and numerous phone conversations with him while working at Briarwood and later at another subdivision. Wright remembered their first meeting in September or October 1995, when Adams asked to view a house for sale. She recalled that Adams stood too close to her and despite indicating he had questions, didn't ask a single question during the viewing. When other potential buyers arrived, they immediately left and returned to the office. On November 5, 1995, Adams visited Wright's office again, filling out the guest registration card as Jim Adams. According to Wright, Adams repeatedly visited her office and called her, asking her out on dates each time. It became apparent that James Van Adams exhibited a repetitive pattern of criminal behavior. The victims he attacked in California in 1990, including Michelle England, Susan Wright, Kim Ramos, and Melissa Cunningham, shared similar physical characteristics. Additionally, they all worked alone, and the incidents occurred in the afternoon. In the cases of Melissa Cunningham and Kim Ramos, Adams requested that they accompany him to an upstairs location in a two-story house. The evidence found near Michelle England's body suggested that he made the same request to her as well. Adams's method of attack involved putting his right arm around the victim's necks, as seen in the cases of Michelle England and Melissa Cunningham. In both instances, the attacker removed the victim's clothes and attempted to sexually assault them, indicating that Adams was preparing to commit a crime. Adams targeted potential victims who worked alone and could show him houses for sale without witnesses. The trial process proved to be another ordeal for Michelle's family, who were present in the courtroom. The judge had to remove Michelle's mother, Peggy Cohen McCall, due to her emotional outbursts as she screamed at Adams. However, Adams seemed to take pleasure in seeing Michelle's family suffer and periodically flashed a grin during the trial. On July 14, 1997, the court sentenced Adams to death, despite his claims of innocence throughout the trial. He subsequently exhausted all legal avenues to appeal the verdict. Citing the 1990 incident in California, where Melissa Cunningham escaped as evidence that he didn't intend to kill Michelle England. Adams argued that, given this previous incident, the jury should have concluded he was guilty of premeditated second-degree murder, not first-degree murder. Ultimately, all his appeals failed. Adams was found dead in his prison cell on March 14, 2005, and attempts to resuscitate him were unsuccessful. The cause of death was asphyxia, which he had inflicted upon himself. Upon hearing the news, Michelle's family, including her mother Peggy, were overjoyed, with Peggy describing it as a good day. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you, the case of Sarah Everard. Sarah Everard was born in June 1987 to Jeremy Everard and Susan Everard. Her father worked as a professor of electronics at the University of York, England, United Kingdom, and her mother worked in charity. She was the youngest of three children in the family, with older siblings James Everard and Catherine Everard. The family home was located in a quiet cul-de-sac in the Heslington area of the city and Sarah would often be seen playing in the street with her siblings and other local children. She attended the local comprehensive Fulford School in 2005, where she was remembered as an incredibly likable, vibrant, caring and popular girl who excelled at sports and performed well academically. After completing her A-levels, she left Fulford School in 2005 after securing a place at Durham University where she studied for a degree in human geography and graduated in 2008. Sarah started her career as an account executive at Proximity London in July 2008, where she worked for four months. After that, she joined Rapier as a senior account manager in September 2009. She worked there for three years and six months 
before leaving to work at a travel agency. From February 2021, Sarah has been working as a digital account director at McCormack & Morrison, as well as a freelance client lead at Flipside Group, a freelance company. On the evening of 3rd March 2021, Sarah was walking home to Brixton Hill from a friend's house near Clapham Common. Unfortunately, something terrible happened. The following day, Sarah's boyfriend, Josh, reported her disappearance to the police. They were supposed to meet, but she didn't show up and didn't respond to any of his calls. Her family and friends were shocked as she was in regular contact with them, and it was completely out of character for her to disappear like that. A large-scale search operation was launched, involving hundreds of officers and members of the public. The search concentrated on the area between Clapham and Brixton, including parks, woodlands, and other open spaces where CCTV footage had captured Sarah's presence the previous night. Police stated that she was believed to have walked through Clapham Common after leaving her friend's flat and heading towards her home in Brixton, a journey that should have taken approximately 50 minutes. The police issued a public appeal for information, requesting anyone who had witnessed Sarah or had any relevant information that could assist the investigation to come forward. They released footage captured from the dash cam of a passing police car and a private doorbell type camera, which showed Sarah walking alone along the A205 Pointers Road towards Tulse Hill, south of Brixton. She spoke to her boyfriend on her phone for around 15 minutes and agreed to meet him the following day. It was uncertain whether she made it home. The police also released a photo of Sarah and a description of her attire when she was last seen. She was wearing a green rain jacket, navy blue trousers with a white diamond pattern, and turquoise and orange sneakers. It was believed that she was also wearing green earphones and a white beanie hat. The investigation was led by the Metropolitan Police's Specialist Crime Command, which deployed over 120 officers and staff to work on the case. The search was conducted with the assistance of police dogs, helicopters, and specialist search teams. Specialist officers were brought in from across the force, and the police received more than 120 calls from the public regarding the case. They asked anyone who may have relevant dash cam or other footage to come forward. Sniffer dogs searched gardens in streets around the search site near Everard's presumed route home and in the nearby Oakland's estate. Officers also searched a pond in Clapham Common and drains along the A205. Investigators quickly found CCTV footage showing a police officer from the Forces Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Command, later identified as Wayne Cousins, with Sarah Everard on two occasions. The footage depicted them next to a rented Vauxhall Astra along with the car's license plate. It was discovered that on the 28th February 2021, Cousins had reserved a white Vauxhall car from a rental company in Dover. On the 3rd March, after finishing a 12-hour shift at the US Embassy in London, he travelled to Kent to pick up the rented vehicle. Subsequently, he drove back to London, where he was seen in Earl's Court and on Battersea Bridge. Upon reaching Clapham, he drove to Earl's Court again before returning to Clapham around the time Sarah Everard went missing. Cousins had parked the Vauxhall on the pavement outside Pointer's Court, stopped Everard, and showed her his police warrant card before handcuffing her. Around that time, Cousins and Everard entered the car, and Cousins drove to Kent, where the route of the car was retrospectively tracked using CCTV and ANPR. Cousins and Everard were again spotted in Dover and had transferred to Cousins' personal seat car. Cousins then drove to Hodes Wood near Ashford, where his car was captured on CCTV in the area between 3.22 and 6.32 before driving back to Dover to switch back into his rental car before returning it. The Metropolitan Police then arrested Wayne Cousins, along with a woman, at an address in Kent in connection with Everard's disappearance and they were taken into custody. However, the woman was later released without charge as the detectives continued their investigation. They found that Cousins had told senior colleagues that he was suffering from stress 
and no longer wanted to carry a gun. Cousins bought and filled a petrol container at a service station in Whitfield and then drove to Hodes Wood, where his car was captured on CCTV at 12.37. He reported himself ill from work, handing in his equipment, including his police belt and handcuffs, which raised suspicions of murder. The police searched Hodes Wood and found human remains that were confirmed to be Everard's body through dental records. Her remains were found in a large builder's bag, approximately 100 meters from a plot of land that Cousins owned. The police also searched the site of a former body repair garage previously owned by Cousins' family at the top of the White Cliffs. The detectives questioned Cousins and learned that when his mobile phone had connected to cell sites in the area of Clapham, where he had sexually assaulted Sarah and strangled her to death using his police duty belt, he burned Everard's body inside a refrigerator he had bought. He then bought two large builder bags from B&Q before returning to Hodes Wood, where he used one of the bags to dispose of Everard's remains in a pond. He drove his personal car to Sandwich, Kent, disposing of Everard's mobile phone, where the police divers searched underwater in one of the town's watercourses. The police also focused their search operation around the rope walk in Sandwich and cordoned off approximately one square mile of the town. Sarah's disappearance and the heartbreaking discovery of her remains drew people from all walks of life together in grief and solidarity. The call for change echoed through the streets as individuals raised their voices to demand a safer world for women. Sarah, a vibrant and compassionate soul, was a beloved daughter, sister, and friend. Her disappearance left her loved ones devastated and searching for answers in a world where her safety should have been guaranteed. The investigation concluded that Sarah Everard had died from compression of the neck, according to the results of a post-mortem held at William Harvey Hospital in Ashford. Cousins was charged with Everard's kidnapping and murder following authorization from the Crown Prosecution Service. He appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court and was remanded in custody before appearing at the Old Bailey from Belmarsh Prison. Cousins pleaded guilty to kidnap and sexual assault and admitted responsibility for Everard's death on the 30th of September. Cousins was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order with Fulford justifying the severity of the punishment by saying that Cousin's use of his position as a police officer to detain Everard was the vital factor that made the seriousness of this case exceptionally high. Cousin's tried to apply for leave to appeal against his sentence, but his appeal against his whole life sentence was rejected by the Court of Appeal as of December 2021. Cousin's was imprisoned at HM Prison Franklin in County Durham and was further charged with four counts of indecent exposure related to alleged incidents in January and February 2021. He pleaded guilty to three incidents of indecent exposure that took place in Kent in 2020 and 2021. Sarah's story has sparked important discussions about women's safety and empowerment, leading to various initiatives and advocacy movements with the shared goal of creating a world where women can walk freely without fear. The global outcry for change following Sarah's tragedy calls for accountability, respect, and a shift in societal attitudes towards women's safety. We honor Sarah's memory by working towards a world where every woman can live without fear, where safety is a basic right, and where unity and empathy prevail. Sarah Everard's legacy will be one of strength, unity, and hope, inspiring us all to stand against violence support women's rights, and strive for a world where everyone can live without fear. Hello friends, today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Luz Maria Lopez. Luz Maria Lopez was born on March 17, 1995, in the small town of San Cristobal Verapaz. Her family was simple and modest. Her parents were Amaralis and Brian Lopez. Luz Maria, was the youngest of two children. She grew up with her older brother, Omar. As an infant, she faced a life-threatening intestinal obstruction. To save her, 
Doctors performed a complex operation without guarantees of success. Her mother prayed fervently for her recovery and firmly believed that her daughter would pull through, and she did. The surgery at such an early age did not impact Luz Maria's development. Throughout her school years, Luz Maria actively engaged in sports, especially gymnastics and athletics. She also had a passion for classical choreography. Her creative nature made it easy for her to communicate and connect with different people, quickly forming friendships. Academically inclined towards the humanities, she excelled in her studies. After finishing school, Luz Maria contemplated higher education and opted for a prestigious state university. She decided to pursue a law degree and later specialized in criminalistics due to her genuine interest in this field. A significant moment occurred during her student years when Luz Maria and her mother visited a car dealership in Coban, the capital of Alta Vera Pass. It was Omar's 25th birthday that year and they wanted to gift him something special, a motorcycle he had always dreamed of. At the showroom, a polite and attentive young consultant named Jorge welcomed them. He showed them various models and provided recommendations. Mother and daughter chose a model but wanted to consult with the head of the family before finalizing their decision. They left with a business card from the dealership and Luz Maria's phone number for future reference. Soon after, Jorge called Luz Maria. Not about the motorcycle, but on a more personal note. Over time, these calls became frequent until Jorge mustered the courage to ask her out for coffee. It was clear that he had a strong attraction to the beautiful, sultry brunette, but he was unsure how to initiate their acquaintance. Luz Maria also found this handsome young man appealing. When he proposed they meet, she agreed readily. Although the young man was a year younger than her, this slight difference didn't hinder their growing connection. Their romantic relationship blossomed almost immediately. Both felt it was love at first sight and believed in a future filled with happiness together. After only a few months, the couple chose to live together despite their parents' disapproval of such haste. Soon after, they were married Approximately six months later, they held a wedding ceremony, inviting only their closest friends and family to celebrate with them. However, issues arose on the day of the wedding. The banquet venue encountered a problem, which almost disrupted the entire event. The couple had to pay a significant additional amount to ensure the celebration proceeded as planned. Little is known about Jorge, Luz Maria's chosen partner. Born in 1996 in Santa Catalina Latina in central Guatemala, Jorge was the eldest of two sons and grew up with his brother Pablo. Their family often faced financial hardships, balancing on the edge of poverty. Thus, there wasn't enough money for luxurious clothes or expensive toys. It barely covered necessities. Despite these challenges, Jorge lacked aspirations for a better life and didn't focus on studying or securing a decent job. People who knew Jorge personally described him as withdrawn and sometimes even aggressive due to his trouble controlling emotions. Consequently, he didn't have many friends and struggled with relationships. Nonetheless, meeting his dream girl sparked determination within him. He worked hard to win her love and hurried to marry her out of fear she might change her mind. It's worth mentioning that Luz Maria's parents were skeptical about their son-in-law right from the beginning. Overall, despite some initial challenges and doubts from others around them, their connection remained strong and unwavering. Something about this young man didn't sit right with them. They couldn't pinpoint it, and they couldn't convince their daughter not to marry him. Soon after the wedding, she became pregnant. Without a university degree, finding a good job was tough. Employers didn't want to hire someone inexperienced and expecting a baby, so she had to settle odd jobs. Her husband, by that time, had lost his job too and wasn't eager to find a new one. When their daughter Alice was born, money became really tight. With both of them unemployed, they struggled to pay rent or even buy food and basic necessities. Then Jorge suggested moving in with his parents temporarily. Luz Maria Lopez resisted for a long while but eventually agreed. They couldn't stay on the streets with a baby. Luz Maria Lopez's mother was aware of her daughter's family issues 
and often urged her to come back home. But Luz Maria Lopez kept saying things would get better with her husband, and there was no need to worry. One day, the mother decided to visit her daughter and granddaughter at her son-in-law's parents' house and found a distressing scene. Luz Maria Lopez was in terrible shape, eating just once a day, and that too very little. However, Shohei's family didn't see the need to provide for their unemployed daughter-in-law. It's terrible. Luz Maria Lopez was breastfeeding Alice, so lack of proper nutrition threatened both their healths. But inadequate meals were only part of the myriad problems she faced in her mother-in-law's home, as she later discovered. She was constantly humiliated and even beaten by her husband's younger brother. He was irritated by the crying of the child and the presence of items in the house. His frustration him to repeatedly throw these items at Maria. On one occasion, he launched a baby bottle that struck little Alice, who was in her mother's arms. Jorge witnessed all of this, but never once stood up for his wife and daughter, acting as if they were strangers to him. Maria's mother persuaded her to take her granddaughter and return to the parents' house. Soon after, Jorge appeared at their doorstep, asking his wife to come back, promising he would find employment. She agreed, but only on the condition that they would rent an apartment and live separately from Jorge's parents. When Maria successfully defended her diploma, she fulfilled a long-time dream by securing a job with the city prosecutor's office. A smart, talented, and responsible young woman, she quickly earned the respect of her colleagues and began moving up the career ladder. Over time, the family's financial situation improved considerably. They could even afford to buy a car for two. However, this improvement was solely due to Maria's diligent work and reputation. Shohei was still searching for himself and preferred living at his wife's expense. He was jealous, lazy, and a domestic type with an explosive temper, which worsened over time. Shohei did not want to work, taking only temporary part-time jobs, if at all. He preferred sitting at home in front of the TV, drinking beer with friends, and spending what his wife earned. Moreover, Jorge was pathologically jealous and tried to control every move of his beloved. He did not permit her to make friends or have lunch with colleagues in cafes or just be somewhere without him. Constantly checking her phone records and reading messages became routine for him. He also forbade her from registering accounts on social networks. At home, when left alone with Maria, Jorge's behavior did not improve in any way. He often created scandals in seemingly calm places, constantly clarified his relationships, and habitually blamed his wife for any problems or family troubles. When they lived at his parents' house, Shohe never stood up for his wife. He just watched as she was humiliated, insulted, and occasionally even beaten by his relatives. Jorge himself also sometimes resorted to violence and didn't see anything wrong with it. He treated Luz Maria as if she were his property, believing she would endure everything and wouldn't leave him. Neighbors frequently heard screams from their home and saw signs of beatings on the young woman's face and body. Luz Maria repeatedly tried to leave her husband and considered filing for divorce. Several times, she took her daughter and moved out to live with her parents. However, each time, her husband would go there, literally begging on his knees for forgiveness. Remarkably, each time Luz Maria forgave him and gave him another chance, despite her parents urging her to come to her senses and leave the abusive man. On December 15, 2020, after another violent altercation with Jorge, Luz Maria took their three-year-old daughter Alice, got into the car in tears, and went to her mother's house. The following day, Jorge arrived there. His intentions were unclear, whether he wanted his wife back or simply the car. He claimed he had found a job and assured everyone that their lives would change. Additionally, he promised never to raise a hand against his wife again. Surprisingly, Luz Maria believed him yet again and returned with him to their rented apartment. In mid-January 2021, Luz Maria called her mother to complain that not only did Jorge fail to secure a job as promised, but had also stolen the money she earned, effectively leaving the family destitute. Her mother felt sorry for her daughter and offered financial help so they could get by 
until the next salary was received. The women agreed to meet on the morning of January 19th, but Luce Maria did not arrive at the designated time. She decided to visit her daughter's workplace the next day. Upon arrival, she discovered that Luz Maria Lopez hadn't shown up for two days, and no one had been able to contact her. At the same time, Jorge, also searching for his wife, appeared at the prosecutor's office. He mentioned that they had argued again and thought Luz Maria Lopez had gone to her mother's house. He figured she wasn't answering because she was upset with him. The concerned mother immediately felt something was wrong and suspected her son-in-law might be lying. She went straight to the police to initiate a search for Luz Maria Lopez without delay. That same day, an alert system named Isabel Claudina, originally Alerta Isabel Claudina, was activated nationwide. This emergency system was triggered for young women reported missing. When the extensive search began, Luz Maria Lopez's husband was quickly identified as the prime suspect, though it would actually be more accurate to say he was the only suspect. Luz Maria Lopez had no known enemies or reasons someone would kidnap her, and Jorge was the last person seen with her alive. Naturally, he denied any involvement in her disappearance, asserting that he himself was distraught over her absence and irritated by being labeled as the main suspect. Despite his denials, Jorge repeatedly contradicted himself during questioning and failed to provide a clear explanation as to why he hadn't informed the police on the actual day of his wife's disappearance. He claimed he believed she was at his mother-in-law's home but didn't call or visit there. While law enforcement searched for witnesses and combed through areas for any clues, a breakthrough came on January 22nd. Municipal workers accidentally discovered Luz Maria Lopez's body while responding to a call about a clogged storm drain near a road. Upon lifting the grate to access the drain, they found an unusual large plastic bag containing something black inside. Upon closer inspection, the observers were horrified to discover charred human remains. They promptly reported this gruesome finding to the authorities. Upon arrival, the police officers speculated that the body might belong to Luz Maria Lopez, who was widely looking for after Nationwide. Forensic experts later verified that the remains were indeed those of a young woman. Her parents and brother, despite the severe disfigurement caused by the fire, confirmed her identity with certainty. What's coincident is that the package containing her remains was found on the same street as the prosecutor's office where she had worked. This location lacked surveillance cameras and lighting. Despite how badly burned the body was, pathologists determined that she had been severely beaten before death. The cause of death was asphyxia, indicated by internal hemorrhages, multiple fractures sustained while she was still alive, and particles of dried blood in her nose and mouth. Additionally, there were deep marks on her neck, pointing to strangulation. At the time of discovery, no new suspects had emerged in the investigation. The victim's parents firmly believed that their son-in-law had brutally murdered their daughter. Consequently, Jorge was taken into custody while authorities examined his motive for committing such a heinous act. In addition to the investigation, psychologists and criminal analysts needed to scrutinize the marriage and family dynamics closely. During these proceedings, Ms. Lopez submitted a disturbing audio recording sent anonymously by a neighbor familiar with her daughter's household. This person had frequently witnessed domestic disputes between Luz Maria and her husband, but decided to record one such incident without realizing it would culminate in murder. The audio captured Luz Maria desperately crying for help amid little sobs in the background. Ms. Lopez was horrified by what she heard and lamented that if this witness had alerted authorities earlier, her daughter might still be alive today. The individual who captured the recording did not contact the police, nor did they visit the residence from which the distressing screams emanated. The authorities were unable to trace this anonymous person, making it impossible to involve them as a witness in the investigation. Consequently, the audio recording was included in the criminal materials. A key witness gave a detailed interview urging all citizens to stay vigilant and report incidents of domestic violence to the police 
rather than merely documenting them with devices such as cameras. This approach, she stated, could potentially save lives. This crime triggered significant public outrage, Stelly, prompting thousands to take to the streets in protest, demanding that the perpetrator be brought to justice. Jorge was promptly taken into custody, but persistently denied any wrongdoing. He claimed he personally drove his wife to work on that ill-fated day when she subsequently vanished. Street CCTV footage indeed captured their vehicle heading towards Luz Maria Lopez's workplace that morning. However, due to tinted windows, it was indiscernible how many individuals were inside. None of the video clips showed the car stopping or Luz Maria exiting. Further discoveries were uncovered at the couple's rented home where faint traces of cleaned blood and drag marks were detected. These findings suggested that a violent crime likely occurred there. An additional piece of evidence came when microscopic fragments of burnt flesh were discovered in the trunk of their family car. Moreover, during their search, investigators paid close attention to a recent purchase made by Jorge and his wife, a double orthopedic mattress. It wasn't so much about the mattress itself, but rather its dense polyethylene wrapping, which analysis revealed had been used to transport Luz Maria's burnt remains. Additionally, several neighbors testified about having repeatedly heard Jorge verbally abusing and threatening his wife with death just days before her sudden disappearance. Her husband had shouted that he would kill her if she decided to leave him, and that he would hide her body so that no one would ever find it. Based on the data collected by expert criminologists, as well as the testimony of several witnesses, the investigation presented a gruesome picture of the crime. The murder occurred on the night of January 19th, 2021. The day before, the couple had a big fight, and Jorge once again resorted to violence with his fists. He had previously had issues with his temper, but this time, he went into an uncontrollable rage. He struck his wife multiple times, causing her to scream and cry for help. These screams were heard by their neighbors, but nobody called the police. During the beating, Jorge broke his wife's nose and caused a head injury. After this brutal assault, he strangled her with his bare hands and then attempted to dispose of the body. He dragged it into the backyard, doused it with campfire liquid and set it on fire. However, Jorge did not anticipate how smoky and foul-smelling the burning flesh and hair would be. Concerned that neighbors might notice and call the fire department or police, he quickly extinguished the fire. He wrapped the charred remains in plastic and sought a secluded location where he believed the body would never be found. The most horrific aspect was that Jorge committed these acts in front of their young daughter. Despite her tender age, she somewhat comprehended what was occurring. The child, three and a half years old at the time, witnessed both the beating and subsequent murder, as evidenced by her cries and screams, which were also recorded. Aware of some forensic techniques from his wife's textbooks at home, a fact due to their abundance, Jorge attempted to cover up his crime and establish an alibi. He found a dark stretch of road without lights or video surveillance cameras and disposed of his wife's body in a drainage sewer there thinking he could go unnoticed. The next morning, he drove to her place of work along the usual route, as if he had taken Maria there just as he did every morning. The following day, he began to simulate an active search for his wife, calling her colleagues, acquaintances, and relatives. The criminal's lawyers delayed the trial as much as they could. They also attempted to throw the investigation off track they insisted that all the evidence and witness statements were circumstantial, emphasizing that not a single piece of evidence unequivocally proved Georgie's guilt. Defense attorneys tried to get the detention changed to house arrest. They argued that Jorge himself was deeply depressed due to being accused of killing the woman he loved and the mother of his child. However, decisive evidence came from data obtained from Maria's phone. All this time, the device was in her husband's possession. On the first day after the crime, several messages were sent from it to different people in an attempt to create the appearance that Maria was still alive. Tracking all movements of the smartphone that day, 
showed it was constantly in the same places as Jorge's phone. Despite this evidence, lawyers tried to turn it in favor of their client, claiming Jorge found his wife's phone and drove around with it searching for her. Yet no one could explain why he was sending messages from it or calling it from his own cell phone. Another proof of guilt was bruises and scratches on Jorge's body found on the day of his arrest. These marks were photographed by experts and indicated that Maria clearly resisted. The most vivid was a scratch on his neck. Unfortunately, particles of Jorge's epithelium under Maria's fingernails couldn't be found because they were destroyed by fire. Despite many controversial points, the prosecutor asked for the maximum possible punishment for Jorge. Court hearings and proceedings were repeatedly postponed due to the raging worldwide pandemic. But in October 2022, Jorge was finally found guilty of his wife's brutal murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Although he maintained his innocence throughout, custody of little Alice was given to her maternal grandparents, who admitted their granddaughter now holds the main meaning in their lives. This here story is about 26-year-old Elle Edwards. On Christmas Eve 2022, she was celebrating with her friends in a pub in Alley Village, Liverpool, UK. The girl was real vibrant and beautiful. She worked as a cosmetologist in a local beauty salon and was also an assistant to a dermatologist. Elle was naturally positive and mighty kind, which allowed her to win over even the most demanding clients. Elle was pretty and had become an excellent specialist in her fields. The gal was cheerful and always smiling, but at the same time she remained determined, constantly moving towards her goals and dreams. On December 24, G22, her sister Lucy flew in from Dubai to spend the holidays with the family, and Elle eagerly awaited her return. They decided to celebrate this long-awaited event in style, so the girls and their friends headed to the local pub. Here they had a great time, laughing a lot, dancing, and singing karaoke. In the merry atmosphere, no one noticed that a person to whom kindness was alien was nearby. Round 11.50 p.m., an emergency call came in. As they were exiling the pub, no less than 12 shots were fired, and two of them hit Elle. She suffered a gunshot wound to the head that proved to be mighty serious. The dispatcher directed emergency services to the same. They urgently like arrived at the pub, loaded the gal into an ambulance, and took her to the local hospital. However, she died on the way, as her injuries was incompatible with life. When the police informed the victim's family about the tragedy, there was in a state of shock. No one believed it, and no one understood how this could have happened to Elle. No one suspected that this beautiful and cheerful girl could have had deadly enemies. In the early stages of the investigation, the detectives had no leads. The assailant had attacked unexpected like and disappeared just as mysteriously, leaving only a shell cast in and the bleeding victim at the crime scene. The attack was sudden but well-planned and gave Elle no chance of survival. But was the gal the true target of the attack, or did she become a random victim of a madman? An unknown car stopped near the pub entrance, and minutes later the shooting started. In addition to the deceased, four other men received gunshot wounds of varying severity, all of them young people aged 22 to 33 who were spending the evening in the establishment and lived in the nearby towns. Initially, the police were inclined to believe that the murdered woman was a random victim. It was known that criminal gangs were operating in the area periodically. The shooting was likely to routine showdown between their members. However, all of this was just conjecture, which would have to be proven or disproved in the course of the investigation. So the detectives delved deeper into the victim's personality. Like the witnesses to the crime, the victim's relatives were at a loss as to who could have wanted Elle's death as the girl seemed to have no ill wishes or enemies capable of such horrors. The detectives decided to interview other witnesses and the victims of the unknown criminal's gunfire. In addition, law enforcement officers requested the pub owner's video surveillance recordings. It would be necessary to talk to dozens of people and analyze several hours of video recordings. Several police officers were working on the extensive investigation. It was necessary to answer several difficult questions. There were too many victims of the attack, but was this spontaneous aggression? Or did the perpetrator pursue a specific target? All witnesses to the incident were interrogated. However, checking mobile communications data took more time. The media were notified to assist in the investigation. Law enforcement officers urged anyone with valuable information to come to the police station. 
First and foremost, this concerned possible video recordings made by random eyewitnesses, on any of which the car in which the aggressor arrived might appear. After the crime, the police held a meeting with local residents. The purpose of this communication was to persuade people possessing valuable information to share it with law enforcement officers. It was assumed that someone might have seen the moment of the attack or know the criminal. People were urged not to be afraid of the criminals and the local feuding clans. Community leaders supported local residents during this difficult time. In addition to the conversations, activists went door to door and communicated with the neighbors. Special trained officers worked with the family of the deceased, their goal being to provide them with support in connection with the heavy loss. In the course of this work, it was established that the perpetrator had left the pub parking lot in a dark colored car. Eyewitness accounts regarding it make differed. It was dark and it was difficult to make out anything but the most likely was a dark Mercedes A-Class. Later, this was confirmed after checking the outdoor surveillance cameras. The killer did not immediately open fire, but drove up to the parking lot and observed the pub visitors for some time. He sat in the car so that he could freely see the entrance and most of what was happening inside. Apparently, he was choosing the most convenient moment for the attack. After a few minutes of surveillance, when L came out, the criminal quickly got out of the car, fired 12 shots, then instantly got back behind the wheel and disappeared. Investigators, after studying the recordings, made an important conclusion. The attacker was alone, no one helped him. It was not possible to trace the exact location where the perpetrator fled. Therefore, the detectives went door to door to all local residents, describing the car and recounting the circumstances of the incident, trying to establish the identity of the killer. Patrolling the streets was carried out around the clock, and this yielded results. Just two days after the shooting, detectives detained two suspects, but no names were mentioned until all the circumstances were clarified. However, it was not possible to prove their involvement in the crime, in particular because the murder weapon was not found. After that, the detectives made a statement to the public, saying that they would not rest until the unknown shooter was punished. All this was intended to calm the local residents, who were outraged by the rampant crime and the powerlessness of the authorities. It was also assumed that the attack had been provoked by a feud between local gangs. In this case, L would be considered a random victim. However, all this was also just an assumption that remained to be verified. In the course of the investigation, it was possible to establish that the potential targets could have been Jake Dutley and Kiram Seld, members of the local Beechwood gang, who were spending the evening in the pub. It became known that they had been in long-term, fierce conflict with another group claiming this territory. On December 29, the police arrested another person, but he was not the one who opened fire. The suspect had a solid alibi that excluded him from the list of suspects. However, the detective suspected that he had participated in the setup for the attack. Around the same time, the dark Mercedes car in which the killer had left the pub parking lot was identified, but due to the lack of direct evidence, the name of the third suspect was also not disclosed. There were some difficulties with the found car, the car was traced through video surveillance systems and identified thanks to the cameras, but law enforcement officers were too late. On December 31, the police department received the report that the fire had started near the scene of the shooting. When the special services arrived at the scene, they found a darkness fades similar to the perpetrator's vehicle, which was engulfed in flames. The vehicle was completely burned out. Valuable evidence was lost in the flames. The perpetrators clearly knew that the police were on their trail so they decided to destroy one of the direct pieces of evidence. Despite the fact that the fire did not completely destroy the car, it was confirmed that it had been used during the shooting. However, the Mercedes did not belong to the perpetrators, but had been stolen shortly before the attack. Presumably, the arson was committed intentionally to complicate the investigation after the murder of competitors. On January 11, two more suspects, a 22-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman, were delivered to the police department. They were arrested in central Wales. The man's name was Connor Chapman. He was well known to the police. He had an extensive criminal record that he had accumulated over the past five years before the murder of El Edwidza. Connor had started with daring lawbreakings and gradually sank deeper into the abyss of crime. One of his first serious crimes was a car theft under aggravating circumstances. He had repeatedly become a suspect in robberies, hooliganism and threatening behavior. Once the young man was involved in a chase with the police, after which he abandoned the car and hid in the bushes nearby. When they detained him, 
the criminal said that he did not understand what chase they were talking about and that he was here just waiting for a friend. In this case, he became the real star. The detainee's data ended up in newspaper headlines. Kyla Chapman was from Birkenhead, Liverpool. His parents had left him at an early age, so his grandparents had formalized guardianship. It was in their house that the hero of the story moved. The teenager dropped out of high school shortly before the exams. In general, he studied poorly and no special hoax were pinned on him. He was always considered a problem child. The young hooligan first became a defendant in a court case in 2014, when he was 14 years old. Connor was accused of shoplifting. As early as 2016, he committed another crime. His involvement in the theft of a car was proven when the young man was detained in a stolen vehicle. He did not have a driver's license or insurance, which was a violation of the terms of his suspended sentence. In 2017, high theft was added to the storage of prohibited substances. During this period, he was also under police supervision, so he had again violated the restraining order. As a result, he was banned from accessing several parts of the city. Connor was not allowed to appear in public places, as he clearly posed a threat to society. However, as early as 2019, he violated the ban again. The patrol detained him in a public place. The young man had a knife and prohibited substances with him. In the same year, the general public first heard about Connor Chaplin. He appeared on the pages of the local newspaper after an unsuccessful attempt to escape from the police in a stolen car. The city patrol noticed a stolen Audi on the street and ordered the driver to stop and get out of the car with his hands up. However, the 18-year-old Chapman did not obey, provoking a chase. During the short flight, Connor committed a large number of traffic violations. In particular, he accelerated to more than 80 kilometers per hour in areas with a 30 kilometer limit. Tana repeatedly drove into oncoming traffic and in the end crashed into the curb. At the beat, the car was thrown aside and turned around. The driver could not continue the orgy, so he got out of the car and ran away. However, even here he was unlucky, as the patrol caught up with him in the bushes just a few hundred meters away. In his defense, the young man said that he was waiting here for a friend, but the deception was obvious. The lawyer of Connor explained in court that his client had fallen under the influence of a bad company of older phrase. The court left him unpunished and the need to release the budding criminal. He was found to have attention deficit disorder and a number of other disorders identified by private specials during the trial. Despite this, due to numerous violations and potentially dangerous behavior on the road, he was sentenced to a term of up to eight months in prison for two minors. The young man also received a ban on driving a car, which was in effect after his release. Thus, the budding criminal had achieved 14 convictions for 30 criminal episodes by the time he reached adulthood. It was obvious that he had no intention of changing and categorically refused to fit into society. Everyone understood that he was potentially dangerous, but legal grounds for isolating him from society had not been found. This was due to the fact that so far no person had been seriously injured by his inadequate behavior. The public was outraged by the powerlessness of the authorities. Everything was shaping up so that the criminal elements could do nothing until they kill or maim innocent people. And that's how it turned out. In January 2020, the court again sentenced Connor Chapman, this time to 10 months in prison. He was again caught in a public place with a cold weapon and substances in his pocket. A whole bouquet of prohibitive lists. During this period, the police openly appeared on TV channels, urging the public to beware of this young man. After serving his sentence, protected months, he again got involved in crime and was wanted for at least five criminal episodes. When he was caught, the young criminal said that he had spent more time behind bars than free, and he did not seem upset about this, but rather proud of his achievements. However, Connor had no intention of stopping there. By the age of 20, his service record had expanded again. By this point, he had received 19 sentences for 43 crimes. But in the summer of 2022, the inadequate young man found himself free again. This happened just six months before the death of L. Edwardser. During this period, Connor was again brought before the court. His lawyer tried to play on pity, telling the story that the first child of the young man was born while he was in prison. At this point, his girlfriend was pregnant with a girl. The young man claimed that he had rethought his life and wanted to get on the path of correction. Of course, these were loud, false words. The only thing he wanted was to get free and return to the path of crime. During this period, the police already knew that he was a member of one of the local criminal gangs engaged in the sale of prohibited substances. 
However, the criminal was tried not for these serious crimes, but for burglary and theft of two electric motorcycles. On December 24, 322, a skirmish broke out between two rival criminal gangs. They began to argue over the division of the territory near the wooden church in Beechwood Estates. They failed to reach an agreement, after which the young gangster decided to take revenge. He armed himself with a submachine gun and waited for about three hours until he tracked down his targets. He wanted to kill Karen Seld and Jake Duffy, who had gone to the Moyak pub for rest. Shortly before midnight, the criminal drove up to the parking lot and began to observe. He identified his victims and waited for the right moment to attack, then ran out of the car and fired 12 bullets into the building. He managed to seriously injure Duffy, but despite the threat to his life, he survived the attack. However, the unlucky L. Edwardsu was not so fortunate. Two bullets hit her in the head. The young beauty fought for her life, but died in the arms of the medics on the way to the hospital. The girl accidentally met the killer's targets that evening and did not even suspect that the festive revelry could end so tragically. The pub was crowded, then one person was killed and four were wounded. One 22-year-old man was shot in the leg, a 24-year-old young man was wounded in the arm, and a 33-year-old man in the wrist. None of these injuries were life-threatening. Elle's friends tried to provide her with assistance and perform artificial respiration right on the spot. However, this was not enough to save her life. Elle's sister Lucy was much liked here. She lived in Dubai and flew home to celebrate Christmas with her family. Just minutes before the attack, she had left the establishment, so she was not affected at all. Later, Lucy recalled how she had wanted to take her sister with her, but the girl wanted to stay with her friends. On January 25, 2023, the funeral of the young girl took place Hundreds of concerned people came to say goodbye to the random victim of gang showdowns. The body was brought to the local church in a hearse drawn by four white horses. Even the pub that had become the site of the girl's last celebration was closed that day as a mark of respect for her memory. The owner of the establishment published a message of support for Hell's family on his official social media page. Connor Chapman was charged with a whole list of charges, the main one of which was murder. It became known that the perpetrator had an accomplice, namely the 20-year-old Thomas. After the arrest and during the searches, a video recording was found on this young man, which had been made shortly before the attack. In it, Connor is handing over a weapon and saying that he is going to settle accounts with someone. After the attack, they together hid the stolen Mercedes in order to get rid of it later. The murder weapon was never found. However, the killer's DNA traces were found on one of the shell casings fired. It was obvious that it was Connor who loaded the weapon before the attack. In addition, red gloves were found during searches in his house, which were clearly visible in the CCTV footage from morning. After the crime, when the perpetrators had abandoned the car, they ordered a taxi under a false name. They used the driver's services to cover their tracks and confuse the investigation. Around 5 a.m. they returned to the place where the hidden car was located. Here the criminals tried to cover their tracks. However, something went wrong. Ultimately, they decided to get rid of the car by setting it on fire. Thomas Nord was found guilty on all charges brought against him. In July 2023, the court sentenced him to nine years in prison. This modest sentence was due to the fact that he had not yet managed to accumulate such a wide criminal history as his accomplice. Jake and Karen were wounded in the moment of the attack, but both managed to survive the assault. A look at their lifestyle made the aggression of one of the members of the rival games quite understandable. Both were members of the local Beechwood gang, which was openly in conflict with another group claiming this territory. It became known that on December 23, 2023, just a day before the attack with firearms, they had already been attacked. On that occasion, another person from Connor Chapman's group had assaulted them. Both were beaten, but did not receive serious injuries. Apparently, they considered this a random fight and calmly went to relax in the pub. While the shooter awaited his sentence in the case of the murder of the innocent victim, both targets of his attack were already in prison. Curran was sentenced to 27 months in prison for an attack on members of the rival criminal group. Another nine months were added to the sentence for the fight. His friend was sentenced to two years and nine months for a similar offense. Obviously, they were trying to avenge the attempted murder. Prohibitive court orders were also issued against both of them, with a whole list of restrictions. Of course, this method did not allow protecting citizens from this gang of criminals. However, in case of further violations, more severe punishment could be applied to them due to ignoring the prescriptions. 
The public was outraged that potentially dangerous members of criminal games were getting away with minimum sentences after each crime. The bans were clearly ineffective and did not contribute absolutely anything to public safety. This became especially obvious when it was found that Chapman already had a ban on visiting that region where the pub was located. But this did not prevent him from stealing a car and coming to the public place, despite the fact that he also had a driving ban. The events that had occurred once again raised the question of toughening punishments and revising the existing norms of the legal system. However, so far this flawed system has not suffered any serious changes. At the trial on the case of Elle's murder, Connor tried to refute that it was he who appeared on the CCTV footage. According to him, during this period he was at home, packing Christmas gifts. However, a sufficient amount of evidence was collected to expose the lie. The hearings on the case lasted three and a half weeks during which all the circumstances preceding the attack were revealed. It became known that the reason for the attack was only the competition between the two criminal gangs dividing the territory nearby. The defendant did not even know the victim. He simply did not care about her fate, as well as the fate of all the other innocent people in the bar. He was driven only by blind fury, which he could never control. After the attempted murder of two competitors, Connor planned to flee to Spain to cover his tracks. He used a stolen car and also got rid of the murder weapon. Trying not to fall into the hands of the police, he avoided using any mode of transport. The detectives detained the criminal literally at the airport. After the arrest, Connor tried to deceive the police, claiming that the Mercedes he was seen driving on the day of the murder was not stolen. According to him, this was a common car of the criminal group, which they used for the distribution of substances. The guy claimed that he was not behind the wheel of the vehicle and also continued to convince the jury that he did not open fire that evening. He was desperately trying to get out of the situation. The defendant stated that he had only just learned that someone from the criminal group had used the vehicle for an attack on the pub. Before the jury retired to consider the verdict, the father of the innocent victim made a short speech. He sincerely hoped that the criminal would never again be able to spend Christmas with his loved ones in freedom. The jurors, consisting of Pity Ashen and San Genshin, came to a unanimous decision after three hours of discussion. In their opinion, Connor Chapman was guilty of all the charges brought against him. He cynically committed the crime and did not repent of the fact that he accidentally killed the beautiful 26-year-old girl. The whole life that lay ahead of her, and he took it away. Instead of remorse, the heartless Connor spent several days carefully getting rid of all the evidence and traces of the murder that could link him to this bloody event. The motive for the attack was the competition between criminal games. On July 7, 2023, Connor was sentenced. He was sent to serve a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 48 years from the start of serving the sentence. After the verdict was announced, the victim's father victoriously raised his fist. The incident provoked a wave of public outrage. The residents of the city could not feel safe, knowing that they were at the junction of the confrontation between criminal games dividing spheres of influence. They knew that these people had a large amount of firearms and were not afraid to use them, as proved by the murder of El. The girl's father said he wanted to set up a foundation to support victims like his daughter. He believed that the main goal would be to fight to reduce the number of weapons in the hands of civilians. Lisa Maria Kaiser was born in 1994 in a large family where her eight siblings also grew up. It was a large but far from prosperous family. Parents were busy with their own problems and did not show love and care towards their children. Moreover, there were rumors that abuse and violence were rampant in the family. The story in question unfolded in the year 2020, at the very time when the whole world was consumed with the fight against COVID-19. In one corner of Ecuador, quietly and unnoticed, truly terrible events were unfolding. Here, in the small parish of Pifo, on the northeastern outskirts of Quito, the protagonist of this tragic story was born and raised. Lisa Maria Kaiza, a woman with an enigmatic gaze whose life story became a true Ecuadorian nightmare. On that unfortunate Tuesday, October 27, 2020, Lisa sent several messages to the father of her children, David. They were words full of despair because their paths with David at that time had already almost parted. In these lines, she confessed her love for him and her unexpected new pregnancy. However, in subsequent messages, Lissa wrote that life was losing its meaning for her, and the decision to terminate the pregnancy was inevitable. Throughout the night, Lissa pleaded with David to come to her, 
but his refusal was resolute. His parents also urged him to stay home, and David took their advice. In the early morning hours of October 28th, neighbors in Lissa's home heard a faint cry for help. Looking out the window, they found a woman lying on the floor with signs of vomiting. The neighbors rushed to help her, immediately calling emergency services. The doctors and police arrived and found Lissa in a critical condition, but still alive. After administering first aid, she was immediately hospitalized. However, in the house, her children, a girl of five and a boy of nine, were found unconscious. The doctors were unable to help them. Their little hearts had stopped beating at that point. Authorities learned the identity of the children's father and contacted David Acosta, who upon learning of the tragedy, immediately arrived on the scene accompanied by his father. He was informed that Lissa was in the hospital and his children were found without signs of life. After several days of fighting for life in the hospital, Lissa finally regained consciousness. By that time, the investigators, guided by their findings, had presented the prosecutor's office with sufficiently convincing arguments to issue an arrest warrant for this mysterious woman. When she was released from the hospital, she was immediately transferred to a social rehabilitation center. The authorities insisted that Lissa undergo a psychological and psychiatric evaluation as her state of mind required further investigation as part of the upcoming trial. Lissa ended up in a rehabilitation center and doctors and psychologists took up their work. In a conversation with a criminal psychologist, Lissa opened up about her difficult childhood where her parents fought and abused each other and their children. Her childhood had a noticeable impact on her state of mind and moments of quarrels and her parents' divorce became an integral part of her memories. Such a childhood forced Lissa to go to work from the age of 11 to be able to study. The girl strived to escape from her dysfunctional family and build her future in a different way. The expert report also indicated that Lissa had been abused. She talked about how, after several years of marriage, David, her husband, changed dramatically. He began to humiliate his spouse and then to raise his hand against her. On the day of the tragedy with the children, investigators working at the scene found several glasses with liquid residue on the table. These finds later revealed traces of epilepsy pills belonging to one of the children, as well as other chemicals requiring identification. Police officers thoroughly searched the house, and after noticing a strange odor in the kitchen, noticed a suspicious area under the utility room. They broke down the barrier and found a lifeless body wrapped in a blanket with characteristic signs of having been there for a long time. Later, further investigation revealed that the discovered body belonged to Jaime Yanchaguano, a 28-year-old who had been in contact with Lisa. Jaime had been reported missing by his family days before the gruesome discovery. According to Rosa Yanchaguano, Jaime's sister, he was last seen on October 18th. Rosa told investigators that after her brother disappeared, Lisa called several times inquiring about him. Lisa claimed to have received a text message from Jaime where he mentioned that illegal substance traffickers were holding him captive and demanding a ransom of $8,000. She strongly warned Jaime's family not to contact the police. This claim became a crucial point in a complex investigation as detectives sought to solve the tragedy and uncover if there were any other hidden victims. During her interrogation, Lisa revealed that in 2020, while working at a cookie factory, she met Jaime Ian Chiguano. According to her, they became friends. Lisa wanted to return to her husband, who allegedly planned to blackmail Jaime for money. David made it clear to Lisa that if she did not help him, he would divorce her. Later, David gave Lisa a white powder and told her to put it in Jaime's food. Once she did, Jaime fell asleep and never woke up. Realizing what had happened, Lisa, in desperation, tried to win back her husband, but failed. In her despair, she ingested the same poison and gave it to her children. However, the poison did not have the expected effect on her, and she sought help from her neighbors to save herself from the horror that had befallen her children. Following her testimony, Investigators launched a thorough investigation, but no evidence of David's involvement was found. 
No one close to the couple could have foreseen that Lisa Maria and David Acosta's lives would take such a tragic turn. When they met, Lisa was only 16 years old and still in high school, a dreamy and romantic girl, while David was a strong and determined young man. Their friendship quickly developed into strong feelings, leading to Lisa's unexpected pregnancy. Although their families disapproved of their relationship, David's parents supported their son and welcomed Lisa into their home. In difficult times, David's family provided genuine support to the young couple, even inviting Lisa to live with them to ensure she completed high school. When Lisa turned 18, the couple got married. Two years later, they were expecting their second child, a daughter. David's parents decided to provide the young couple with their own home, giving them an apartment where they found a corner of family happiness. However, over time, their relationship began to deteriorate. Both spouses were unfaithful, leading to mistrust and disappointment. Their once boundless love began to weaken. Lisa also complained of psychological abuse from David, prompting her to seek help from the police. Eventually, she was granted a protective order, forcing David to leave the family home. At this point, Lisa began to blackmail David, demanding money for the chance to see their children. In early September 2020, Lisa's life took an unexpected turn when her eldest son began suffering from seizures. In desperation, she took him to the emergency room at Baca Ortiz Hospital. After stabilizing his condition, doctors conducted tests and diagnosed a focal form of epilepsy, a severe condition affecting a specific part of the brain. Doctors advised Lisa to undergo further tests, including MRIs, and to consult specialists urgently. However, Lisa ignored these recommendations. A month later, her son suffered another seizure and they returned to the emergency room. Reviewing his medical history, doctors discovered Lisa had not followed their earlier advice, failed to complete tests, and had not seen specialists, leaving her son without necessary treatment. They warned her that continued neglect could lead to legal consequences. Despite the warnings, Lisa disregarded the medical advice. A few weeks later, after her son's condition resurfaced, she called David, who was alarmed by her serious tone. She informed him that a social worker would visit to discuss. To brighten the waiting time, Lisa offered him a drink. However, as David drank the drink, he suddenly felt unwell. His condition was worsening and the social worker had not shown up. So David decided to go home to get something to deal with his discomfort. The next morning, David woke up in a terrible state. He could barely speak because his tongue was numb. Every step caused discomfort and his eyes hurt. His parents insisted on calling an ambulance. David was taken to the hospital where he spent several days. Tests revealed the presence of a psychoactive substance in his system. But given that he hadn't used anything of the sort, David began to speculate how this could have happened. Eventually, he speculated that perhaps someone had deliberately slipped him some substance in a public place. David was grateful for his life and realized that what had happened could have ended much worse. In early October 2020, Lissa made the decision to hire a nanny for her children. Her cousin Patricia recommended her friend Bertha, a responsible 48-year-old woman looking for work. On Monday, October 5th, Bertha arrived at the young mother's house. Lissa urged her to take a pill that she said helped prevent infection with the COVID-19 virus, an epidemic of which was at its height at the time. Claiming that it was a highly effective natural remedy, Lissa convinced Berta to swallow the medicine and enter the house. They sat down to discuss the babysitter's childcare duties. A few minutes later, Bertha began to feel sick. She felt a headache. Her stomach began to upset, and eventually she vomited. A short while later, Patricia showed up. It turned out that she had called her cousin repeatedly, but Lissa didn't answer, which alerted Patricia. She decided to check what had happened and immediately went to her house. Upon entering, she found Berta lying on the couch, who was practically fainting already. Lissa shared with her cousin what had happened and expressed concern. Learning that Lissa still had not called an ambulance, Patricia immediately did so herself. After a while, Doctors arrived and sent Berta to the hospital. The condition of the victim managed to stabilize. Doctors diagnosed poisoning with a toxic substance, which often happens when using various medications. 
Doctors decided that Bertha did not tolerate some component of the composition of the pills from COVID-19. A few months before this tragic incident, in June of the same year, Lissa's former buddy, Mark Escanto, had died of poisoning. At the time, the cause of his death had gone unnoticed. But now, given all these strange circumstances, Mark's case required additional attention. Investigators scrutinized the deceased's home and found Lissa's fingerprints on the glasses used the night before Mark's death. This fact added new evidence to the investigation, pointing to Lissa's possible involvement in the incident. But suddenly, a new accusation was made against Lissa. Her own family made a shocking report to the police. It turns out that on September 2nd, the family had a family gathering where Lissa offered to let everyone taste a drink of her own making. Seven brothers and sisters of the young woman, as well as their parents, drank the unknown drink and immediately felt sick. Fortunately, no one died, but the 56-year-old mother suffered a stroke. Lissa's father claimed that while the relatives were seeking medical attention, his daughter stole $1,300 from the house. Now the investigation included not only crimes against the children and a former boyfriend, but also an incident that jeopardized the lives and health of her own family members. As it turned out, that wasn't all. Investigators encountered another strange event. In May of that year, Jose Luis Erazo, a friend of Lissa's, was found dead in his home. A few days before, Jose had suddenly disappeared, and neighbors soon smelled a rotting odor, prompting them to contact the authorities. An examination of the body initially revealed nothing suspicious and was ruled a heart attack. But one of Jose's sisters suspected something strange and hid a bottle of alcohol found in the refrigerator. In addition, Jose's family noticed that some items were missing from the house. It turned out that Lissa and Jose were friends, and when the guy died, the alleged killer contacted his relatives by phone. With a distraught voice, she stated that Jose owed her a large sum of money, and she had to contact the family to repay the debt. This cunning plan did not work, and a little later Lissa called Jose's family again, changing her voice to conceal her identity. Identifying herself as Jose's friend, she claimed that she was pregnant by him and now had to apply for child support. Although Jose's family did not believe these stories, Lisa was not about to give up and made a third attempt to deceive them. She said she knew who was responsible for Jose's death and offered to meet to uncover the details. Had she not been arrested on charges of killing her own children in Jaime, the list of victims might have gotten longer. When the media reported the arrest of Lisa, who had poisoned three people, Jose's relatives understood. They immediately reported their suspicions to the authorities, and Jose's body was exhumed for forensic examination to determine the true cause of death. The relatives were not mistaken. Traces of poison were found in the remains of the deceased. On December 22, 2020, a hearing was held for Lisa Maria Kaiser for the murder of her two children, whose names and photos were classified, and for Jaime Yanchaguano. The trial was conducted virtually due to restrictions related to the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Lisa had been in contact from a social rehabilitation center. The prosecutor's statement said that Lisa gave her children a toxic mixture of insecticides and anti-epileptic drugs. In interrogations, she claimed that she had grown desperate and could not leave her children with her husband, David, who did not care for the children. In fact, she admitted that she wished them dead. At the end of the hearing, the judge issued the defendant a court pass and ordered her remanded into custody pending trial. The children's trial next took place in 2021 at the Pichincha Provincial Court. The prosecutor presented a set of evidence to prove Lissa's guilt. Among them were statements by David, who revealed the content of messages the wife had received on the eve of the tragedy. In one of the messages, she claimed that she would take with her what belonged to her, referring to the children. She said she didn't know where her children and herself would go, heaven or hell. But now she felt as if she was in hell. Lissa added that she doesn't expect her husband to forgive her because she knows he hated her and now he will hate her even more. David also spoke about his unstable relationship with his wife. At the hearing, the defendant's reconstructed testimony was presented, stating that she took two pills that day, called for help, and then passed out. According to the reconstruction conducted by the prosecutor's office, 
The daughter died while still in bed, and her older brother tried to take a few steps to call for help, but fell and died. The conclusion of the forensic medical examination was extremely clear. The children died as a result of a premeditated crime. The deaths were the result of suffocation caused by pulmonary edema and intoxication caused by a mixture of epilepsy medication and other unspecified substances, presumably insecticides and disinfectant. The prosecution also charged Lissa with the death of Jamie Ianchiguano, whose body was found bricked up in the kitchen. The perpetrator was also suspected of attempting to kill David and members of her own family. The hearing raised the issue of Lissa's irresponsible attitude to her son's health after being diagnosed with localized epilepsy. The mother ignored instructions for further tests and follow-up examinations, and when the boy was hospitalized again, his condition was exacerbated by her own mother's negligence. Warnings from medical professionals did not change her attitude toward her son's treatment, leading to a threatened termination of her parental rights. Lissa's mental health investigations revealed her to be highly emotional and environmentally dependent. She sought constant attention and understanding from others and experienced severe anxiety when events did not unfold according to her plan. She also exhibited a tendency to self-harm. She attempted to say goodbye to her life at least three times, but was unsuccessful each time. Witnesses described her as insecure, attachment-seeking, exhibiting schizoid and erratic behavior, the findings of the psychological analysis also emphasized that on the day of the tragic events, Lissa acted with full awareness of her actions. After a long trial that lasted 10 months, Lisa Maria Kaiser was found guilty of the crime against her children. The Pachincha Provincial Court sentenced her to 34 years and eight months imprisonment. In addition to this, she was ordered to pay David a compensation of more than $20,000. It was noted in the press that Lisa remained calm throughout the proceedings and only showed emotion when her children were mentioned. The Jaime Yanchaguano murder case, which began in August 2021, appeared to be unfinished. New details were revealed during the court hearings. Lisa admitted giving her friend a white substance mixed with alcohol, but claimed she got it from David. However, the investigation proved otherwise. According to a psychiatrist who interviewed Lisa, she did not want to take Jaime's life. She wanted to intimidate his family so she could then extort money. She did demand $8,000 as ransom. Experts called the plan disorganized, which ultimately led to the crime. In addition, forensic tests revealed that it wasn't that simple. Jaime was found to have poison in his system and the cause of death was strangulation. The body was found with a shattered ribcage and wire around the neck. Lissa claimed that after her friend died, she decided to bury him under a back room and cement him in. The store owner's testimony confirmed that Lissa bought building materials during the days of Jaime's disappearance. After the party's arguments, the prosecutor's office requested a new trial in April 2022. At that trial, an additional charge of extortion was filed. Lissa called Jaime's relatives, claiming he was being held by a group of gangsters and demanded $8,000 for his release. The defense relied on the lack of conclusive evidence that Lissa was involved in Jaime's murder. Nevertheless, she was found guilty and received a 22-year prison sentence, as well as a sentence to pay $5,000 to the victim's mother. While Jaime's trial was underway, the investigation of Mark Escanto and Jose Luis Arazo, Lisa's alleged victims, was nearing completion. Mark Escanto was 48 years old, and tests conducted after his death revealed traces of the same substance that Lissa had given to her children. In addition, Mark was found to have severe inflammation of the stomach. The family's lawyer claimed that Lissa met Mark, offered him a beer, and then put the poison in the drink. A glass with Lissa and Mark's fingerprints, as well as a swab containing the woman's DNA, was provided to authorities. Alleged motives for the murder included jealousy and money. It is also known that Lissa had asked Mark to help her financially and there is evidence that he loaned her at least $120. Mark was Lissa's first known victim. The final outcome of this case, as well as that of Jose Luis Arazo, remain unknown. They may not have been reported in the press, or the investigation may not yet have reached the stage of being formally charged and brought to trial. At the time of her brutal crimes, Lisa Maria was only 26 years old. 
Her high-profile criminal case has become one of the most horrific and disturbing in Ecuador's recent history. These crimes made her known throughout the country as Doña Venado. Lisa Maria Kaisi is recognized as a serial killer in Ecuador. Her victims have endured terrible suffering, and their relatives have suffered unbearable pain. The charges include five murders and nine attempted murders. Under Ecuadorian law, the maximum sentence she could face is 40 years in prison. That means Lisa could be released when she turns 70 years old. It is still unclear what motivated Doña Venado to commit such horrific acts. Was her act the result of resentment for not getting what she expected in life? Many speculate that the motive was money, and in David's case, Lissa acted out of a lust for revenge, which led to the tragedy with her children. The most horrific part of this story is not only the number of victims left in the path of Doña Venado, but also the fate of two innocent children who could not have guessed that their mother, who gave them life, would take it away so absurdly and cruelly. Thanks for watching, guys. Jack was with you. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click a bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.